so I, I have four sites set up, the one that we've been looking at and um, uh, uh, Kharkiv, and then I also have LA, Odessa, and San Antonio. Uh, okay. But if I go back to the main one here, I added another attribute that's called operational status. So you see that right there? Uh, no, I didn't see that. It was... oh, no. no, you didn't see it? I went too fast. Um, and it was kind of small. So I was looking, there's a lot of colors. There's a lot of new boxes. Yeah. Okay, I'm zooming in right now. But basically, it's each of these buildings has an operational status. At, and I just put random information here, too. But basically, so it's almost I like... I don't see uh, something that says operational status. Oh, what do you see? Yeah, um, so I see it. It's over on the far right. It's the column label on the far ah, right column. Sorry, I've got my uh, operate. Yeah, my uh, pictures were there. Yeah, you guys, the images were there. I'm just so if we have the uh, the gen set, for example, we could say it's at port and holding facility, and from here we can even change it to a different condition: decommissioned, deployed, whatever. In transit, so I thought it would be a way to kind of communicate about how these things are moving around and being prepared, or even at the factory or whatever. So that's new. And then my thought is that we have these here in Kharkiv, and then we would just start that conversation that we had with Will and um, about the. Uh, let's see. I guess we start with the containerized. And we just pull these into position, right? And then for Mark's analysis, that was the hospital annex clinic. Yes. So before I do this, Mark would have presented, right? That we have a problem in one of the hospitals there. The clinic is damaged or whatever, and you're doing an analysis of what's there, right? So Kimon, I think you're the best conductor and you get to bring in the people that, that's best. Will has mm -hmm. time constraints. So we need to spend as much time with Will between 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, it's 9 a.m. right now. Uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Yeah. Eastern. 10 to 1, what? Uh, all right. Oh, so. Yeah. No, from one I've got to two. just think in Eastern time. Yeah, yeah this is talk Eastern. Okay, All right, ahead. so from one to one thirty, Will is available. Okay. Then at one thirty Eastern, he goes away. Yeah. So, okay. So we have to do the whole scenario. Of his. We um, need him. Yeah, his involvement is that first half hour. Yeah. And okay. We can do the medical application. You know, let's focus on modeling the microgrid with Will. Yeah. And if we can get into a little bit of what is the microgrid powering, mm -hmm. then, yeah. Okay, so here's my suggestion. Then we start. In we start with Will, just like we discussed. We said we have this facility in Kharkiv. It has exam rooms that are not functioning, and we need to power that. And we immediately go to the site plan and say, how do we power it? It's in this building. Okay, so um, let's start the opposite way. Let's say here is Will. He is sending these microgrids to mm -hmm. Ukraine. Right. The, you, the microgrids that are there can power batteries for headlamps. Right. And if we needed to, we could put all of his 24 together and power part of this clinic. Right. But what he really has are these uh, larger uh, tent structure with solars, and that would be better. As a matter of fact, what would be better still is these other types. And then we'll get into uh, John's involvement 
with his larger generators after Will is gone. Okay, so Will's powering just those headsets. That's it. That's all he's going to be doing with this big stack of things. First is the I mean, headsets because that's okay. real, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's the power packs, the mobile power packs that can. Mobile power packs help this clinic if the electricity yeah. goes out. Okay, so here's the power packs. We brought them to the clinic. So we got, we've taken care of the headsets. The headsets are now powered with these mobile power packs, right? Right. And okay. here's the clinic. It's got eight operating rooms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and if okay. the power goes down, there's enough power packs for uh, medical procedures to occur. Right. Okay, so we deployed them for these power packs. We're done with that. Right. Then we say he's got the tent structure right. with a larger array, and this can actually power the room. That's right. So we yeah. want to build up the microgrid concept. Right. And, and he the, also has this containerized, this is, the, this is a big boy for him right here, the containerized right. one. So the container actually is, comes with the array, I think, and can also support the tent structure. So it's this, this is uh, more power than just the uh, LED lights. It's actually Correct. helping the clinic. He yeah, said okay. three rooms. Right. And he might say for those, oh, we can only do three rooms. Maybe we need a, we have another container or we have another array or whatever. It'd be good if we exactly. can just say, let's and then let's you bring another one in. Duplicate yeah. it and show how much space is needed. Can this fit here? Yeah. So there it goes, two arrays or whatever. So we can start doing a few duplications like that. And then we can make sure they fit on the site in the parking lot near the building that has the power of the problem, right? Correct. Okay. All right, so that's good. So that probably would take 20 minutes or so, even back and forth with him, that part of the discussion, right? Correct. And he, and he's gonna be showing more details about what these things are, right? I don't, um, he can switch to his images. Do you have any of his images? Yeah, I have them parked here on the micro. Yeah, he, uh, this is what you guys. Yeah, this is what you guys can have open in the background in case I get busy. You could be showing this stuff because I have okay. all this. Uh, the asset. Uh, let's see, where are they? Microgrid modules, microgrid assets. Okay, under microgrid assets, at the bottom, I have all his stuff right here. Okay, let me uh, call it up. So that's sites.google. Here, I'll put it in the link. Everything. I, the, the, in fact, you guys can even help by editing. I think I gave you editing access to this. You can paste new images, or if you're taking screenshots, uh, we can paste them in later. But I'm trying to collect just everything here. In fact, this is if you have a Google Drive with folders, and it just it's a whole folder of drives can add in here. So I have Wills, and then I also have the Trent stuff down here too. Okay, so that's good. Yeah, so that's good. All right, so then um, uh, while Will is around, mm -hmm. you will be alluding to what Mark did. Right. But we won't yeah. bring Mark in until after Will is gone. Yeah, okay, that's good. So now we're in Mark's session. Are you ready to leave Will for a second? Just kind of walk through Mark's yes. part. Okay, yeah. so Mark is next, right? So we could say, okay, this clinic that we were talking about, um, we assigned a task to Mark to quickly evaluate what's out there on site. And we had minimal information. We had information, of, well, Mark, I'm kind of talking for you now here, but, and then Mark did a quick layout to kind of collect the assets, equipment. And this is, I think we need to stress this, right? This is really about the equipment inside the spaces too. It's not just the layout of the space. And the energy generation requirements for them. Right, that's right. So, so what I could do is just while you have this on your screen, I can be walking through my screen and just talk about, you know, here's the site, here's the location. It's in Kharkiv, which is in the northern east, northeastern part of Ukraine. Here's the site that we were we studied. Here are the once we met with the user groups and determined what was needed, because the pictures that I saw, there weren't many walls left. So it's almost like you're rebuilding this, right? 
Well, yeah. we can make them whatever we want to. Yeah, that's fine. That's yeah. So, so that. we're re rebuilding an existing shell, mm -hmm. and after meeting with the user groups, you know, we we thought our, of ourselves as a patient entering the facility. You need a reception mm -hmm. area, you need mm -hmm. a waiting area, and you need a public restroom for those people entering the clinic. And then you have this kind of public private set of spaces. So you have six exam rooms that wind up as the spaces that are going to be utilized by the doctors to examine these patients and determine what is their next step. And then in the private side, you have this workroom and file room off the reception area. You have secure storage with a vault for the patient records. You have a staff lounge. You have cold storage for the, the prescriptions and medicines that have to stay cold restroom, storage and shelving, lockers, an on-call on room for any doctors that have to be on call, and then the typical mechanical room, battery charging spaces, waste and recycle rooms, server rooms that make up this type of facility. So when you, when you are done with this type of facility and the way that we laid it out in the existing shell, you can see that the circulation pattern goes along the path here can you see my mouse if yes. i do that okay yeah. so you see this this circulation path that moves along this corridor and starts to have a private section to the north of the sheet and a a public section to the south of the sheet okay but uh i i love all of that but in our, our limited time, it's really not about the architecture. And I don't want to diminish the work that you put into that. And it's thoughtful and it should be mentioned. Yeah. But it's more about the report on this room requires this much energy. Well, how do we really know what those numbers are? We could just make it up. We could just say that... Um... Yes. We evaluated their six exam rooms, and then I think it's even good to point inside those exam rooms. There is, in fact, we even have the name of the piece of equipment. It's there's a, a vital monitor sign for each one that needs power. Uh, and Will, I mean, um, yeah, Will is going to provide those. The battery packs that are brought in are going to be powering specific pieces of equipment. It's not the whole facility. So it's kind of it's kind of you were able to quickly assess what was there, create an inventory of spaces, create an inventory of equipment, and quickly mm -hmm. isolate which pieces of equipment are critical that need electricity. We don't even have to say how much electricity it needs. That's right, Will's right. deal. And then Will says, well, for what I see here, then I need 20 power packs or whatever. And we need, we don't have to power the overhead lights. We're going to bring in those LED uh, lights that the um, they put on their heads or whatever. <laughs> That, that's the kind of... Um, but we need the hard monitor. Yeah, we need the monitor, that kind of stuff. So we're kind of telling the story that we know what's there now and we know what the what needs to be powered and then Will's equipment can power 20% of the critical equipment here or whatever, or 50% or whatever. I don't think we really need to get into the specifics about the energy, the numbers, even though we have some numbers too. But. Does that make sense? I don't know. That, mm -hmm. That's yeah. my take on it. Yeah. Right. This makes perfect sense. This is about a demonstration of capability. It's not about realism. So yeah. zooming but, into that room. But if, quick, but quickly. If there can be Mike, just one point. So um, Mark's point about being able to do this, I think we don't have to talk about the architecture and the design, like you said, but it's good to say that as an architect, he was quickly able to assess what was there with minimal information to get close enough to be have, have this accurate inventory of assets and spaces, something like that. So is it okay well, to talk I'm about, yeah. is it okay to talk about how easy program to BIM made it for developing that? Or do we want to stay away from promoting any of the Onuma products? We could just say we had an accurate inventory uh, of space types that were already pre-configured we don't have to mention program movements. Okay. All right. No, but, I just thought because, you know, as I, as you and I were talking the other night, it's amazing how much easier it was to know what you need because as you're going through the menu, it's like, yeah, exactly. Oh, I do need one of those. I do need one of those. Yeah. We have a database of online inventory of 
healthcare facilities. So we're able to quickly assess. Digital this, twin. We're digital gonna twins. emphasize <laughs> digital twins. Yeah. And having the digital twins makes it possible. And mm -hmm. Mark, the great thing about Kimon is he's not promoting his software, he's promoting the concept. Right. And the concept is best represented in digital twins. So therefore, if there can be a 3D image of one of those rooms, even if it's not live, if it's just a static image, I think Mark that will help it. people understand. I have one for each room. Yeah, See those? There you go. Yeah. Excellent. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Yeah. So that's so what and I'm and, and what I'm gonna do is just kind of walk through, you know, the story that's changed a little bit. It's all about telling a story. The story instead of going yeah. into you know, create all this by meeting with user groups is we took basically what information there was about the existing facility. And in order to rebuild it, we determined what spaces there were from a database of spaces that we have. And we could quickly assess what spaces would be needed and place them how we wanted them. So I'll just quickly kind of, depending on how much time there is, I can either drag it out or just quickly go through these spaces. No. And quick, then show. Quick is, is the, and Mark, can you start sharing your screen now? Let's practice this share override. Yeah, so ahead. that's really interesting. The way I have this set up, can somebody? Can somebody? Hmm. Let me try it. Let me see what happens when I share it. Because it's not the computer I'm on Zoom, so I don't know. I think it's going to share the wrong screen. But let me try. Because this is a camera. This is coming. What you see is a camera. It's not my screen. All right. Well, then we need to practice this for sure. The other thing is, I, could I, could, share, I guess I could, I could join with the computer that is the camera. I could also just share your uh, presentation. Well, actually, I think, you know, better than that. I think you can, it's not called share. What's it called? You can spotlight my presentation. So just spotlight me as a host. Maybe I can spotlight myself. Well, yeah, I, I just, there you um, go. But it didn't change anything. No, don't. Now you see me as the main pre presenter, right? No, that's still Kimon, right? Kimon? No, that's me. Look, I'll make the slide change. That's me. Yeah, well, no, I'm not. I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing Kimon's screen. Kimon, stop sharing your screen. Yeah, let me hold on a second. Let me see what happens here. So I see Mark's screen as a small thumbnail. Yeah, I don't see your uh, screen as the main thing. What was it? Yeah, I guess Who, I, I guess I have to stop. Huh? You have to. Yeah, whoever's sharing has to stop sharing, and yeah. then somebody has to spotlight my screen. Yeah. Uh, and, and, Removing spotlight. No, I am spotlighting. Hi, Will. Hi. Hello. So does everybody see my screen as, as larger? Yes. Okay. I see it larger. Right. Yeah. Right. So then we can, as we go through the space, now that it's spotlit, I can go through here and talk a little bit about, you know, the equipment in this space. And uh, it's not showing up. I got to work on that. Okay. So I can just, we can, it's yeah. it's kind of dim and fuzzy, Mark, a little bit. Is it? Yeah, it really is. So um, you've sent me your presentation, so maybe I just show your presentation. Um, I don't know if you have the latest one. I'll have to resend it to you. All right. If you've got the latest one, then yeah. resend it. Yeah. There you are. Will is right side up now. Yeah, I figured <laughs> it out. There we go. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. Will, Will, this is Mark. Mark, this is Will. Hey, how are you? Hi, Mark. I'm well. It's exciting to be here. Right. We uh, are kind of doing some dry run activity. Cool. Do you for this the main one? Do you need me on uh, to present anything or just talk? Um, this is what we're determining now. So, okay. um, 
I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Kimon has set you up or set up a page with you know much of your stuff. Cool. But um, you you know if you have anything specific, I mean I also have your PowerPoint. You know that has oh, the, yeah yeah the the remote monitoring yeah. yeah. I think we can if we can just show if people have questions about remote monitoring we can show the the dashboard. I think there's a couple slides in there that have a dashboard. But um, I don't think we need to get into too much of New Sun Road. That's very much a corporate. I think um, you know New Sun Road's promotion deck. These are the. These are the. Yeah, yeah. those are the ones. Yeah, exactly. The dashboard screenshots. All right, so those are there. Uh, if you want to have anything ready, you know, you can have stuff ready. Okay. That's fine. I'll have our general slide, like their thing, overview thing if we need to, but I really don't want to take a bunch of time just to do the about us type of thing. Right. Um, so let's see. Uh, we were trying to figure out the best way for Mark to be so able to. So I, I just tried to send the keynote. It's 28 megs. I don't know if the email's going to work or not. Um, can I drop it, Kimon, and can I drop it in this microgrid assets? In, in the Google Sheet? You're talking about? Yeah. Well, not in yeah. the sheet, but is, is there a drive associated with it that I can drop it in that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll point you to it. I have a whole drive for all this stuff. So while they're doing that, Will, let me just give you a, a rundown. Cool. Um, we're going to do uh, you know, a basic uh, opening introduction, thank everyone who's been involved, uh, and then uh, describe this concept of BIMStorm and using building information models and digital twins to quickly plan and it's been happening for a long time. And for this one, it just so happened that our interest in microgrids led us to you and we're able to do this exercise. Um, then <clears throat> um, Kimon can do whatever kind of uh, uh, background he does because it's important for him to set a stage. Then bring you in and talk about what's really happening, which is very yeah. different. You have sent 24 micro uh, solar microgrids to Poland to be deployed to Ukraine to help hospitals charge LED headlamps. And yeah. Kimon has that modeled and he will land that near uh, something that Mark has created, uh, a clinic inside of a hospital. Uh, existing one. We're just assuming mm -hmm. that this is what's inside there. And we'll show the uh, headlamps, you know, are there's enough there to be able to power for X amount of those rooms. And, and we're, we're just, not that we're making up the numbers, we're saying, you know, a predetermined number of rooms. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. But Will also has uh, the truck and the uh, containerized unit and yeah. those could actually power a number of the rooms but only one couldn't do the whole thing so then Kimon will land another array and say this is how mm -hmm. much space we would need perfect and we think that that's probably going to be to your you know jumping off point at the uh 1 eastern time okay great that's perfect. So then uh, I'll may, I may be doing screen captures or whatever while that's going on. And back at, um, 
3 p.m. Eastern, if you're able to jump in for a while, you can talk to some of the you know, screenshots. You can talk to what has been done. Gotcha. So the first two hours is kind of the back and forth amongst us to create the presentation. And then we're mm-hmm. presenting just the snippets in the next hour. So we're kind of like creating a highlight reel. At 3 p.m.? Correct. Okay, gotcha. I So yeah, the that'll work great. I just have a to jump. I can be on starting now till pretty much, what is it, 3.30 EST. Oh, okay. So yeah, my, I, think, I think my computer probably switched time zones wrong or something. So we're good. All right, excellent. Uh, then you can come in and comment and stuff. Yeah, so I'll be, I might be moving around a little bit, but that's- uh, uh, and Understood. Yourself, yeah, but that's- Take okay. it off and yeah. yeah. Uh, because after you present, um, hi, John from Singapore, who is up really late or really early, and we re- appreciate you. Um, after that, you know, let's just keep it, you know, that you're done at the half hour after the first half hour, because we, we do need to move on anyway. Cool. So Perfect. Good that we thought that you had to go. Um, then we're going to, uh, since we have shown the building architecture, Mark is going to talk about the architecture and using uh, system um, with templates and equipment, assets, the asset information, and the, the electricity requirements for each of the rooms. And he's going to show digital twin of the assets in the digital twins of the room, which creates a digital twin of the building. And then um, we'll be able to say, all right, this might be needed somewhere else outside the footprint of the building. And Kimon could take it to another location. He might say, California uh, Community Colleges has a clinic on this site. It's a similar thing. This is what would require to power, you know, partial rooms. Then we bring in John and say, John, has court experience with these larger containers. Uh, he's got a green ammonium uh, generator uh, that's going to be ready in uh, uh, later this year. And it's actually generates the green ammonium from the crane um, deep, you know, lowering and stuff. And so we'll talk with John about that for a while. Then we'll have other people um, who are commenting, including uh, at uh, what is 2 p.m. Eastern, there will be uh, Art Curlin is coming in and he's a healthcare capital planning and asset management director for a hospital. And he has done a digital twin exercise with Kimon in the past. And we're going to land some of the clinic modules that have been created for him in Ukraine. Kimon, is this tracking? Yeah, so we're not going to show the San Antonio site then, correct? We're just going to be on the Kharkiv site and say, here's the um, pods that we brought in from San Antonio. Perfect. Don't, yeah, don't, need, actually, don't yeah. need to show it. Yeah. Would be good to show LA Community Colleges. Hi, Susan. I hadn't seen her in a long time. She just walked by the window. Um, so, but anyway, whatever you want to do, um, you don't have to land anything anywhere you don't want to or, you know, take up time doing that. But uh, yeah. we'll be discussing that. Then, um, you know, as part of John's discussion, um, we'll be getting into what he's saying about ports and one of the things we need to do to help reconstruct Ukraine is make sure the ports are active and can 
bring in supplies to help reconstruct and possibly bring in medical modules and containers and set them up right there at the port so that they can use the power that's being generated at the port. It's easier to just set things up at the port and start serving people there than to then move it over to another location. Now, if we have people from Ukraine, they might say, oh, no, we don't want to do it at the port. We need to keep the port active so that, you know, we can offload stuff. And we don't mind saying something wrong and having somebody come along and say, that was silly. We need to do it this way. That's what part of this brainstorming is, is to get to the best idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds good. And then we've got um, um, time for doing exercises. You know, if Kimon has something where he wants to say, people click here and uh, create your own clinic and land it. You know, I, I don't know if you've got that uh, in mind at all, Kimon. Yeah, but, I don't know, uh, that might be. There might be too much. What I thought would be interesting is opening up the, the work order request for the main site that we're looking at. Because people yes. can actually see, the, they can get down to the individual spaces or assets or whatever and make comments on that. Um, this heart monitor is not working. Right, or this this room doesn't have any lights or this building is not functioning or whatever. I think I did something. one with the phone not working and replacing the patch cord or something. I don't know <laughs> if you saw that. Yeah, there's a, I could actually show all of it because if, if that's happening, and I don't know if you see my screen now, but if that's happening from the participants and I'll be able to show. No, I don't see it. We don't see oh, your screen. Sorry, I think sure. I turned off sharing, huh? Uh, Mike, my presentation's now on the drive that come on created. Okay. Yeah. And I put a link in the chat. That drive is accessible, hopefully, to everybody if you want to drop anything in during the presentation. But yeah, this is uh, the different requests that come in. So if we start getting, you know, so here's Mark's right here, right? So if we can where, actually get into where, where, yeah. Where's, how did you get there? That's the admin view that you admin. have access to. Yeah. So there's the request from Mark about something's happening in this space, right? Yeah. Oh, that's not his presentation, that's his work order. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, this is live now, yeah. So we can kind of zoom, when we zoom in from the site location, we can be re receiving any kind of requests. Like the first one is this, this hospital annex is not functioning. There's no lights at all in the building or something like that. That's mm -hmm. part of the story, right? That something happened to this building. We need to assess what's there and decide uh, just like we talked about with Will, that we need to bring in microgrids to support parts of that. And then the next one would be the the whole Trent genset units, right, that you just talked about. Um, so that <clears throat> just to back up, since we're all on now, that we, this is what we have set up for the live exercise. We want to then uh, be able to grab individual units and start moving them into position and say we need a 20 kilowatt array here or we need the uh, uh, the genset ammonia unit here if we want to power the whole building. And then we can then say, do we have enough space? Where do we place it? Is it close enough to the actual connection point? Whatever, the, you guys can be doing that part of the discussion. I'll be moving things around. Uh, so just jump in as I'm doing stuff because I'm kind of making stuff, <laughs> making up stuff as I go along here, but uh, it's good to get. Um, is, is there, um work order ability on the uh, microgrids? Yeah, they're all in there. Okay, so then John and Will might want to go in. You might want to show them how to go in and be able to say, this microgrid needs a new... Uh, it's not functioning or it's in service or whatever, yeah. it's in transit, that kind of thing. Right. right? Yeah. So if that's the part that you want them to in interact with, why don't we take a second to show them how to do that? Right, okay, so the, let me paste the link in here. So this is the, uh, uh, where's the chat? I can never, I'm not as familiar with Zoom. Okay, there we go. Uh, this is the link and I'll open it here. 
So every, the plan and the, the buildings that you see in the background are all accessible from that link that I sent you. And it's set up so there's almost like zero training to use this basically, it's, but it's a request form. So I'll walk through it quickly. But uh, from the top, there's a pull down. The pull down lists all the buildings there so you can get to the Trent ammonia unit, for example. And then it shows up as a little diagram down here. And then from there, you can say, okay, there's there's something going on. This unit is not working or whatever. You can start typing in requests directly in the, what describe your request here, unit in transit or something like that. Um, and then you can add photographs or whatever, and you put your name and uh, email and then hit submit basically, and that's it. And that then shows up in the admin view that I showed earlier. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense to Mark and me, but does it make sense to John and Will? Why don't you run through it one more time real quick? Yeah, okay, I think, see. I mean, Mike, it's a, it's a simple form. I think I, I have seen this um, when uh, Kimon shared that on a link. But uh, we, uh, Kimon is talking through this. Yeah, we're not, we're not actually typing stuff in live, are we? There is that option, and it's possible, and it makes it powerful for you to be able to do that. If you want to, it does not have to happen. Yeah, but I, I have just, seen. Uh, I did obviously look at this a few days ago when um, Kimon had shared it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for example, in the clinic that we were talking about earlier, that Mark set up, we could say, okay, this room is not. There aren't any lights, or this piece of equipment is critical. Uh, I could say the type of request. It's whatever the. Um, you can pull down and say there's certain things happening, or you just type type it in basically and saying lights not working um, and you can submit and then that just comes into the request so all of these buildings as we're adding even as we're duplicating so if we were to move for example if we say let's put in another um, trend gen set one and i duplicate that because there's a need for the other building then that would actually show up immediately on that list and we've added other information here to say that it's at the port or it's decommissioned or it's deployed. So there's different values that we're using. That's what the color coding is that you're seeing in the background. It's like the current status of uh, uh, red means it's damaged. Uh, and there's different kind of, then we could start. Yeah, so, so for example, come on, if, if you were, um, if you needed a megawatt or, or a thousand kilowatts, say we're talking kilowatts now. So if you're talking a thousand kilowatts to run something, and then at a later stage, maybe in three months' time, you needed an extra thousand kilowatts because a bit more hospital came online. That's right. Then you would be able to request or demand another unit um, placed in parallel, uh, so you had that deliverable coming up. So you knew when uh, when you were going to get two thousand kilowatts availability, yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So these two buildings here, for example, this one is not functioning right now because there's no mm. power, but this one still is. But let's say a month later, this one gets this changes to uh, damaged or inoperable, inoperable. Then yeah. we say, okay, how are we going to power? We can't power the whole building, but we can power this. So let's bring in two more units or three more units or whatever. And is there space to put them? And that's the the scenario planning that we want to go through there. Mm. So let's just bring. Okay two okay. more here so i added one more so now we have two and then while we're doing all this it's also showing up in our reporting too so because we've added the um uh the energy in kilowatts now uh that that's available so see how there's two listed here now so immediately we have another thousand kilowatts available and we're trying to keep it kind of simplistic because there's a, I, mean, I know there's a lot of other calculations in the background, but we're just focused in on energy generated, energy consumed. I know that might be too simplistic, but but you can fill in the blanks beyond that, I think, as we have the conversation, because you guys are the experts in that. Yeah, so that's, I don't know, any, any other ideas or comments on that? I'm going to turn this one back to... Well... The one comment I had was that when I was going through the Energy Star site 
that was in uh, the government has posted. It talked about medical facilities and what their draw on electricity was. And it came out with 245 KBD, KBTUs per square foot. And so if you do just a small 4,000 square foot facility, the yearly consumption, I believe, would be, uh, it, well, not the yearly consumption. I don't, I'm not sure what it is in terms of time, but it came up with 980,000 KBTU when you multiply 4,000 times the square footage use of 245. It just seems like a huge amount of electricity. It probably is a yearly, right? I'm not sure, but yeah. yeah. So does it make sense that you would have 980 million KBD KBTU for a clinic that's only 4,000 square feet? I don't know. I'm not sure if that really matters. matters. If we're, so if don't we're show the last slide I have. Yeah, because I think we're trying to get to what's the current the last two slides. I think the scenario is if we have this clinic here, how much do we need to get it powered tomorrow for the day or the week or the, uh, right. and then that's that's where the uh, the different microgrid supply. Okay, we can we can power four of these rooms or six of these rooms or this whole building or or we can only power this um, this asset in here, which is the uh, the vital sign monitor. We need to have power to that, which would be the battery pack from Will, right? So you, well, from what I understand, you bring that battery pack into the room and you just plug things into it, right? It's just like a mobile battery, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I think the Energy Star stuff is is really tough, Mark, to get. Um, okay. Like, you're basically trying to take, when you use that website, I've tried to play with it too, and you're yeah. taking grid tide math and trying to apply it to a generator math. And it's okay. really, it's just kind of hard. It's not, so we're not, like we're not going to go there because yeah, we'll, I, we'll, we'll have yeah. a lot of misinformation. <laughs> I would just, I mean, it's not necessarily misinformation. It's just, it, they're assuming that it's like the HVAC system and all this stuff that, you know, might not even be powerable anymore. Like a lot of the, right. we're basically running extension cords through windows, right. And the energy star website is substation to the, load panel you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's uh pro yeah just a slightly different math that we're, we're, when we're doing for looking at rooms we base it on or these type of clinics we base it on what is actually going to be plugged into this generator not what is the annual you know average load of the the whole site yeah yeah because the scenario planning is a the scenario is the hospital um it is fit but there's no power to it um and therefore you would uh, connect something powerful enough to power the whole hospital if you wanted to and the other one if it's half the hospital has been blown up and you're and you're trying to power mini parts of it like you've got mini microgrids uh, around whatever part of the hospital is functioning and so, you know, so one thing is rolling in a generator to power the whole lot, and the other is to roll in a little mini microgrids to, to function the bits of the hospital that are, uh, that are actually uh, able to function. Uh, exactly. Thought, right, right. Um, I think it would be good. We got 10 minutes before we start. Is that right? A few, a little bit, 12 minutes. Should we just go through a run of show real quickly, what we want to do each half hour or each 20 minutes? Um, it's going to change. Um, I can really quickly uh, do that. Um, so first uh, is going to be the introduction, five minutes, hand over to Kimon uh, for Kimon to say what his introduction is, then get into Will. Will um, will uh, interact with Kimon up to the 30 minute mark, uh, 130 Eastern. Then uh, Mark Giuliani and Kimon will explain further about the building that has been created that needs energy. When that is over, then John and Kimon will be talking about John being able to power it and maybe duplicate it and double it and bring in extra um, items, uh, extra clinics and extra generators, you know, because the need might be that great. And what we're trying to do is show the planning. 
Then at the top of the hour at two, uh, we've got um, Art Curlin coming in. And Art is talking about personal property asset management at healthcare. We need to hammer this home because we're the asset leadership network. We're not just doing this to, to be nice. We've got to show uh, that a structured approach to asset management helps all of this. And he will say, um, what is important for tracking personal property? What he did to help his hospital get certified and what might be necessary in an emergency uh, situation like this. That gives us a little bit of grounding in uh, asset management. Uh, so that might be 15, 20 minutes there. Then um, I think there'll be piles up of questions and, and other things that leaves the last 40 minutes, the half hour to be able to uh, address those. And Kimon has a, an exercise that he wants to end on. Um, I believe that's the work order exercise, Kimon. Right, but maybe before we go, there's one more question here. The Odessa port, Mark, you said that it would be good to show this just quickly at the end and say, okay, and then we move the whole scenario to Odessa because that's more about what John also does. Well, I think, yeah, I think that that's pretty, I'm Sorry, not, we talked not about Mark. cranes. Yeah, not, not Mark, I'm sorry, John. <laughs> With the Trent units, we. I don't know if John's still on. Uh, yeah, um, sorry. Um, was that a question? I'm, I'm listening. I'm watching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, at we, the we, end, just talk about the how this all affects being able to power cranes at the docks because that's how everything's got to get into well, the country. Yeah, it's, right? it's more than that. It's it's basically we take the whole scenario from Kharkiv and we landed in Odessa at the port and this whole thing of we have yeah. the same set of capabilities that can draw from whatever I'm making this up again, John, but what you said the other day about powering the, the cranes, but also powering a clinic or other facilities here mm. or temporary facilities with the tents and arrays and whatever. So we don't, I don't think we have to go through a whole planning scenario. It's just kind of hitting the fact that this is uh, all mobile, right? Is that okay? Uh, I mean, it's yeah, it, it is. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, I know it's a completely hypothetical and um, and scenario planning. I'm not sure would would you build normally ports? I mean, um, are, are quite far away from the epicenter of where people and the action is. So, um, so mm -hmm. typically, there and the newer they are, the more further away they are. So. Um, so in terms of being at the heart of the action, when you're looking at um, classrooms or hospitals and things like that, you'd probably not have them on the port, I would have thought anyway. But I mean, it is hypothetical and scenario. Fact is, you can put them anywhere, I think, because I think everything we've done here, come on, is all pretty modular. So and right. that was the whole approach. You could literally ship them on a 40 foot or 20 foot container, drop them under right. the crane there, lift them off, put them on a truck and, and send them with a mini microgrid wherever you want to set that up, whether it's actually in the port or whether it's uh, closer to the, the the town center or whatever it is you're... Right, yeah, that's actually a good point. So we say it's here, the, the capacity is here at the port. It might already be used or it might be coming in and we need to support something like this. And then that, yeah. that gets moved wherever really it's in the city. Yeah. We say, okay, this is not gonna be there. It's gonna be, uh, yeah. there's a spot down here, there's a hospital or whatever. There. Yeah, so it's kind of because telling the story that we're we're mobile. I guess that's the, the yeah. main point. And the first, uh, yeah, because in the scenario, the first uh, risk assessment is is what part of the port is working. So um, yeah. you know, is the whole infrastructure electrical? I'm talking about is that uh, intact, uh, and therefore it's probably a lot a lot easier technically to um, to get set up and plugged in and, and fired up. Um, or, right. uh, you know, has the place been shelled uh, and you're really trying to sort of uh, piecemeal and bring to life uh, things? Because, I mean, obviously you can still power up a crane directly, but it's uh, it was uh, there's a bit more effort involved um, technically in getting that plugged in uh, when it's not in the electrical um, system. 
So, um, so there's a bit of risk planning or understanding to say what's working in the port, how do we connect into it, get the ships in, get them unloaded, uh, and then we, you run from there. Right. So Mike, you suggested that we show this at the end. Does that make sense or what do you think? I can't hear you. Anybody else? Here. I, I don't hear John. Mike, no. Yeah, I heard John. I, I had oh. accidentally muted myself, sorry. Um, this is exactly the conversation that I wanted to have happen in the workshop mm -hmm. so that we would be set for the presentation. Now, I'm glad that we went through this drill prior to the workshop starting because this will help the workshop go smoother. Yeah, because I, I can see here, look, you've got on the left, though, they look like grain silos. So I think actually when you're doing containers to the left, uh, the left hand corner of that Odessa port, it looks like you've got grain silos. So you've got a whole bunch of stuff going on there. Containers to bring in the, the stuff that we want. Um, and you've also got food products and uh, or grain products. Oh, this right here, huh? Yeah. Uh, the one at the back came on down to the down to the left. You'll see a whole bunch of silver silos. So oh, they're axes. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, it. Okay. Just, that's gotcha. it. Yeah. yeah. So they look supply. like grain silos. Yeah. So um, so there's food products there. You want to start uh, moving, um, although that's probably export um, anyway. Mm -hmm. But so for you know, in reconstructing, it might be that they need food. Yeah, although I think, yeah, these would most likely be for export. So, um, but anyway, I mean, you have got food products, we've got refrigeration for medical and food products coming in. So we'd need to fire that up um, either on a mini microgrid or part of the whole terminal microgrid. Yeah. So there's, so there's a few things going on there before you then start to move into town, I suppose, and, uh, yeah. and set up. Yeah, exactly. So if we then say that the, this is kind of being ready to deploy, to deploy mm. and then we move it just like we showed in Kharkiv basically yeah. it would first show up here and then these would be trucked to Kharkiv or these would be moved somewhere else nearby to an existing hospital there's a hospital down here I know about um, but we don't I don't think we have to go through a full scenario here but I think it's interesting no. to to show well, you got a football that. stadium there look so yeah you'll be able to put a hospital in there or something that's, like, so. that's right yeah, so we brought the whole clinic that Mark set up and said, okay, we need a mobile clinic here. So there's a lot of different pieces that we can start. Like maybe this one we take out, that's from the other site, but we have these clinic and classroom set. Um, okay, that's good. So, so we can kind of keep it fluid like that as far as the conversation goes, right? And open yeah. up these different views, yeah. Okay, so we're starting here in a few minutes. Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, one quick question on the sure. the setup of how we're presenting this. Obviously, we we want to reinforce that these these are all um, not real scenarios. Although the real thing is happening in the background, there's other things that are happening. So we're trying to tie it to what's going on. Mike, how, how are you? I, I'll you know, address just... that after I do the introductions mm -hmm. and say, you know, we want to be very respectful for the, the real pain, suffering, and loss that's occurring in Ukraine. Um, and what we're trying to do here is show support. Um, what's needed is war fighters right now, and not everyone can be a war fighter, but there are many of us who want to show our support, and this is our um, activity of showing support and our willingness to be uh, uh, able to plan and help with reconstruction as soon as uh, uh, non war fighter uh, professionals are needed. And that we hope this provides inspiration on how to quickly and effectively uh, recover from the uh, unjust aggression that's occurred in Ukraine. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, and that would uh, go for anything other than Mike outside of Ukraine, I guess, then, because if you do it for this, you could do it for anything in reality. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. We don't want to do that because I, I don't, I really don't want to be 
showing, you know, making it seem like we're trying to uh, commercialize what we're doing, you know, elsewhere. So we want to focus on. Yeah, the sure. Although, Mike, I'm going to show the LA City campus, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. You can okay. do that. Yeah. Did you get my presentation, Mike? I did. Okay. Right, I'm gonna start the webinar. Um, you might wanna go uh, camera off until you're on. Uh, so stop you can... the recording, stop the recording and start it again. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll take care of that in post-production. Okay. But I'm just gonna start the webinar now. Welcome to the 2022 ALN Spring Summit Microgrid Asset Leadership. Today, we're focusing on BIMSTORM Microgrid Ukraine. Uh, yesterday, we did uh, a Microgrid Asset Leadership Roundtable that set the stage. And tomorrow, we're going to be uh, talking with a uh, uh, person who manufactures and delivers uh, uh, is delivering microgrids to Ukraine. And uh, today's session is divided into two portions. The first two hours is the BIMSTORM Ukraine or microgrid Ukraine workshop, where we'll be dis demonstrating the principles of a structured approach to asset management and how that can help with reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, specifically focusing on microgrid assets as they're used to support healthcare. Microgrids can be used for other uh, purposes and the digital twin exercises that we're showing to accelerate planning and processes can be used for other things, but we're focusing in on that for two hours of bringing in experts to uh, talk about what they're doing what they've done in Ukraine and put together the materials for a presentation that will start at 3 p.m. Eastern that shows the capabilities we've uncovered during our, during our two hour workshop. And great thanks to Kimon Onuma, president of Onuma Inc, who's a patron member who has been leading this effort. Uh, and uh, also John Arnup, Thank you for uh, uh, Trent Port Services involvement in this. Uh, he's a new member, but boy, he has hit the ground running. Mark Giuliani is president of Giuliani Associates Architects. He's an ALN senior fellow who has jumped in and provided some architecture uh, expertise and insights uh, for this workshop. And William Hegard, who is president of Footprint Project has made this very real. His company uh, creates solar microgrid generators and um, uh, stations that support emergency uh, response um, and other types of uh, outdoor activity. And he has sent 24 of his solar microgrid generators to Ukraine. So we're gonna be able to start off with uh, William talking about what's really happening with his assets being sent uh, in support of Ukraine. Uh, it makes it very real and we're very grateful for his uh, participation. And the sponsors for um, this summit are Numa System, Trentport Services, and Grant Thornton. And we thank them for their uh, sponsorship. And we also thank all of our patron members and all of our organizational members who uh, are, are very generous in their support of our activities. So with that over, we can uh, go to Kimon Onuma. Kimon has been at the forefront of digital twin and building information models for decades. He uh, launched 
the BIM Storm workshop activity in 2007. The first BIM Storm was in January of 2008, but we spent six weeks preparing it, getting people used to this concept of using digital twins, which was very foreign at that time. It's a little bit more accepted in uh, mainstream now. So it's easier to uh, uh, demonstrate and uh, teach people and uh, has been a great supporter of the Asset Leadership Network. So uh, thank you, Kimon, and uh, thank you for uh, your work involved with this. Can you give us a little bit of background of the importance of uh, Digital Twin? Sure. And uh, you meant, yeah. yeah, so as you mentioned, we've been at this for quite a while, but what's important is to have many people collaborate, not only the people that are technical and, or know about BIM or know about Digital Twins, it's really about how do you get stakeholders to give input, and that's what this BIM storm is really about. How do we get collaboration across many types of users in uh, working with this microgrid. So that's the scenario today is getting participation, seeing things on screen and uh, getting uh, challenging ideas and trying new things and, and solving these difficult problems. Yeah, this difficult problem is uh, very interesting um, because the problem that Ukraine is facing right now um, requires real war fighters. Uh, they're not at a digital twin point in their reconstruction yet, but not everyone can be a war fighter. So those of us who have other uh, skills uh, want to show our support and uh, we're happy to be able to do that through this uh, workshop activity. Great. Yeah, and actually I'm sharing- So Kimon has been talking- Go ahead, Mike. You've been talking extensively with Will Hegard to get information about the types of uh, solar uh, microgrids that he uses. And I believe this is uh, one that is uh, for uh, Puerto Rico, um, a fire station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's different slides that are, these are all posted on the, uh, the BIM storm site as well too. So all this material, we're, we're gonna be running through a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of resources of what's happening right now. And we'll maybe just jump in. Sure, yeah, we're excited to be here. Um, just briefly, my name is Will Hegard. I'm the operations director for Footprint Project, which is a small nonprofit based out of Minneapolis that mobilizes cleaner energy uh, systems to communities in crisis that usually looks like um, putting solar panels and battery systems on uh, trailers or portable uh, generator boxes and deploying them to disasters. So for the um, Ukraine response, we have uh, purchased two solar trailers from a company in Germany and deployed those to the um, Moldova Ukrainian border. Uh, and then we also have a pro project that we're, we're developing in Ukraine, which involves outfitting hospitals with portable solar generators to power LED surgical headlamps that we, we uh, shipped immediately after the, the war broke out with a number of, of coalition partners, um, including a, a nonprofit called Smart Aid and global em empowerment mission as, as key uh, partners in, the, in these uh, programs inside of Ukraine. So we do a lot of, um, you know, our programs look kind of are broken down into three buckets, disaster response, where we're mobilizing equipment for to power up um, critical infrastructure and community resilience sites or resilience hubs, and then uh, in between disasters, we assemble and develop new fleets of community solar generators that are available for regional disaster response. Um, and we incorporate Second Life solar panels and batteries into those um, generator uh, builds between storms. So right now, what we're looking at is, is a number of solar mobile solar generator systems that could range from a portable battery that you can store or or bring inside of a clinic or a, a resilience hub and charge lap, laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, 
um, LED lights, um, kind of the, the basics to keep a, a command center or a emergency medical location up and running. And then that can scale up to mobile, so, you know, solar trailer generators or containerized microgrid systems that can power um, infrastructure, you know, more kind of brick and mortar infrastructure at the, at the um, load panel level. So that uh, picture we're seeing there was a, was a solar trailer and two solar tents that we assembled with uh, Empowered by Light, a nonprofit out of California for a fire station in Puerto Rico. And that system is two Tesla power walls in, inside of it with, a, with these uh, fl flexible fabric solar canopy tents that can store inside the trailer and then be deployed out as a mobile incident command center. Um, so we're, we're really excited to kind of learn from the asset uh, leadership network on how to do these digital twin systems because we have a lot of um, uh, physical solar generator assets floating around the domestic US and now a, a, you know, a starting batch in Ukraine, so to speak. And we're, we're looking to expand that as the, um, the you know, response and conflict continues, sadly. So yeah, happy to talk about kind of any of the, the smaller stuff up to the bigger stuff. Um, and we're, we're excited to be here. And the great thing, uh, uh, Will, you know, really love your heart is that you assume that the assets that you send to Ukraine are gonna leave your control and you see it as a donation and it's not an issue. But for this workshop, we're going to pretend that you're an asset owner who wants to be tracking the assets for their entire life cycle. And so we'll be uh, uh, conducting the workshop with that in mind. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, particularly for the, you know, our first batches of equipment, like the solar portable solar generators are, are very much kind of a, we consider it more of a donation, but we do have reporting, you know, we do need to report on where they went, who they were donated to, et cetera. And we try to keep an eye on them in case, you know, these are, this is new technology for a lot, you know, how many firefighters have actually seen a solar panel or solar generator in person, right? This is, this stuff isn't like, it's not like everybody knows how a solar generator works. Um, so we do end up doing a lot of kind of remote support on equipment that ends up being donated anyways. Um, and then, so, so we're very, you know, we assume we might not get it back, right? We're definitely not gonna get any of this equipment back that we send to Ukraine. It's gonna be there forever. Uh, but the, we do try to keep an eye, you know, keep tabs on it keep an eye on it, make sure that people are using it and, and it's working effectively for, for their needs. And then for the larger systems, Excellent. particularly these trailers in Moldova, we definitely try to keep, you know, they're big investments and we try to keep the, the equipment um, uh, kind of in the network, so to speak, with work orders and, and, and um, tags like that. So we're really excited to, to learn from the asset leadership network and, and the work that kimon has been doing um, can be directly applicable to what we're working on, um, both in the domestic United States and-, and Excellent. Excellent. Um, so why don't we get to the work that uh, Kimon has been doing? Okay. So let's take a look. So what we set up, um, and we put the link to this website here so you can actually follow along. We're, we're posting information here. We started collecting. Well, first of all, actually, this is where we started, right? We started collecting the assets that we saw a little bit of that what we all kind of introduced, getting their actual names, the, 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 the size, the specifications, the power. And then also with John from, from Trent, we had a whole list of assets too. Uh, so these were cataloged here first, and this is the most important thing. This is kind of the data as an asset concept. We need the data that we're all talking about, the same thing that has a size associated with that has a performance associated with that, that can then be used to place on sites. So that's what we're going to go through next. And like uh, was mentioned so earlier. Can we just make an asset, mm -hmm. an asset management concept here? Yeah. So the policy for this ownership is that we will use secure open standards for sharing data. There is no Excel spreadsheet. This is web-based that uh, information that can be accessed from multiple points. And that is the policy of the owners 
the asset owners, which we are collectively all the asset owners. Yeah, excellent point. That's a common and, problem, <laughs> challenge usually. That's a common problem that Kimon has run into for decades. And it is simply addressed with a policy that says, use secure open standards for sharing data. And that allows the continuously advanced advancing technology to be used and not let information get lost. Just like we don't want the assets to get lost, we don't want the data to get lost either. Yeah, so it's the concept of a single source of truth. Because if we had a bunch of Excel files sitting on our desktops and we were sharing the Excel files, it's like a virus. You have different versions of it. Something is wrong, you digest it. So we have this, where you're actually using Google, Google Sheets and Google Forms, you can actually even add another asset here. There's a button here that says fill in your asset information. So there's a form that we set up. Who are you? What do you have? How, how big is it? So it kind of guides the, the collection of data in a format that can then be used. This is the beginning of the digital twin. Once you have it in this format, then you can start essentially this the, the digital twin in a spreadsheet before we start landing in um, locations. Okay. All right. So, um, yes, thank you. Okay. So then we'll just jump into the actual site. There's multiple sites that we're looking at. And as we mentioned, these are hypothetical, but they're pretty close to what's going on over there uh, in many different scenarios. This is in Kharkiv. Um, there's an existing hospital here that we modeled really, real simply. We just created a shape of it directly in the, the tools that are available online so we can see how many floors it is. And we're zooming into uh, a scenario that's based around this location. And as we go through this exercise, this can be applied. Once we get all the, the pieces in place and the rules in place, you can start solving the issues that are specific to this site. For example, which way is south? South is to the bottom of the screen. So you can put a solar array here to power uh, the containerized units and, and the other assets that are here and then bring it into the clinic. That's, that's one scenario. Uh, it's also knowing where to, who needs that type of support, and Will kind of touched on that as well too, getting those requests and then being able to respond to them quickly because obviously everything is, is uh, uh, dynamic as things change. And that's also interesting for me too because a lot of uh, facility and asset owners think of in terms of buildings and assets being relatively static, but even in a normal situation, that everything's constantly on the move, whether it's energy, whether it's assets that are not working, whether it's the need for more space, whether it's people, the population moving around, but especially here in this scenario, things are constantly on the move. And that's what we're, that's the scenario that we're setting up to, to run this test on. Okay, so let's start with just opening up a map. This is a map of the, the US and over here and Europe over here, but these dots on a map, this is a, a digital twin. There's a microgrid in LA, there's a microgrid over here somewhere in Philadelphia, and there's two here in Ukraine. There's one in Odessa, and there's one in Kharkiv. Actually, there's three different scenarios in Kharkiv. Each of these dots represent a lot more data and information in them. So we're gonna zoom into the Kharkiv, we're just zooming into the Kharkiv scenario, a hospital there. And on the left here, we actually gonna click on this. This is actually, using a lot of different sources of tools and everything, but this is our tool as well. It's called the Onuma system. It's a web-based uh, planning and asset management tool. Um, so we have the site here, there's a map and the map is uh, from Google Earth, but you can use other map sources too. That's the great thing about the web. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can use available open source data as well. And uh, we have a satellite map of the area and we our scenario is here to tell the story is we have an existing uh, regional hospital. There's a hospital annex. Uh, we knew very little about this site other than what we could see from Google Earth and what we heard from others uh, in the area. So we're, we're setting up a scenario and saying, okay, if there's a clinic here, this clinic has exam rooms and other units in here that are critical for operations. And red in this scenario is we color coded it red, meaning that it's not, it's damaged, it's interoperable. So the main building is still green. This one is red. Something's going on here. We need to support that. I'm going to pause here if there are any comments from everybody else on the call here. I, I think it's going well. Okay. So we're going to first run through Will's scenario, right? 
Yes, there's no lights in the surgical room, so there needs to be a, uh, a microgrid to charge LED headlamps. I believe you have that model. That's right. Um, so we have, in fact, before we jump there, let's take another quick look here. We have uh, the clinic that, that we're going to talk about later. We'll go into more detail in the clinic, but we actually have modeled uh, what that clinic inside looks like, and we'll explain how we did that. But we have the information about what's inside the clinic, the assets that are in the clinic that need support. There's exam rooms, there's lights in the ceilings, there's uh, equipment, critical equipment. And Will has the capacity and capability to support that, right? Will, you have these units down here, which we have modeled as well, based yep. on those that asset list that we talked about earlier. So we have that 10 structure that we saw in one of the slides. We have the containerized microgrid. We have uh, portable power packs on pallets, I think these are. There's 20 of them in here. Uh, so each of these represents one unit, but we can create multiples as well, too. And there's other assets down here, too, that we'll talk about. But Will, do you want to kind of walk us through what you would do with this? Yeah, so the, the, at the start, I mean, we, we'd start with a site assessment and figure out what the um, lead, you know, basically of, of the area of that hospital annex that is non-functional, what do they need functional? So it, in this scenario, we're going to assume that there's going to be a couple of exam rooms that they're trying to to get uh, power back up in so they can use that those exam rooms for um, patient care or for you know admin or office work for for coordinating care in the hospital where it's still functional so we're just going to assume that we're trying to get electricity back in or energy access to uh, a number of exam rooms uh, in that annex um, so one of the kind of ways we we do this during uh, outage responses is start with uh, portable systems that can be um, brought inside and give, you know, they're a battery pack with a small inverter and that can be charged off of the larger containerized array and microgrid that's placed outside. So we're gonna bring the portable packs into, you know, let's say 20 ex it, power, power packs and there's 20 exam rooms. So we'll, we'll deliver the containerized solar microgrid outside of the annex and set it up um, with the larger array to power the, the shipping container. And then we'll bring the portable power packs into the individual exam rooms where they can be um, utilized directly as like a plug, right? So those batteries will last for each, um, each uh, uh, exam room based on what they're pulling in anywhere from eight to, to 12 hours, and then we'll swap them. So we'll do, you know, either 10 exam rooms and charge 10 power packs, or we'll have to bring in more power packs to charge off of the larger microgrid um, if we're trying to power up, you know, more more exam rooms. So it's, it's very uh, uh, kind of nitty gritty in the sense that we're, we're, we're basically developing or, or programming a battery swap using a uh, containerized solar microgrid as a, the charging, larger charging system um, and the mothership for delivering those portable systems and then dropping the, the um, bringing the portable systems into those individual rooms where they can be utilized as energy access points. Um, that larger solar microgrid, you know, based on the size of the, the hospital annex and what they're trying to power inside that, whether it's HVAC or, you know, if there's a you know more intensive energy intensive medical infrastructure, like a, um, a MRI machine or something like that, the containerized microgrid could be used to power specific loads inside the hospital as long as they were um, appropriately sized and we were running the right um, extension cords, basically. So, but I know that there are, are larger assets, kind of in the megawatt scale or, or uh, larger kilowatt scale that can can be plugged into the building itself if those were available um, regionally. Great. So let's walk through the scenario of how this, so we're now on Google Earth and we're looking at the 
what looks like a, a driveway here to get to that an annex. Actually, this is the annex building on the left here that we modeled. In fact, there's the exam rooms that uh, we're going to be seeing later, but it looks like this street. So there's a lot of, I don't know, probably doesn't look, I don't, I don't know what it looks like today, but anyway, this is what the, the infrastructure there is like. And in the scenario here, if we're trying to get this container in here, uh, I think you mentioned earlier that the first we have to get the container in and if we're going to deploy the array, this is actually the, the solar array and how much space it takes for 20 kilowatts, correct? Yep. Uh, and uh, the containerized microgrid, the power packs are going to be delivered in, in the, um, it could be inside the containerized uh, microgrid, but then it could be pulled out individually or basically have mobile battery packs, right? That can be moved into individual clinics to power individual units within the room. Correct or the yep. LED lights. Exactly. So this is a very light, lightweight solution, quick and lightweight solution to get immediate power to the the the, the, the source the, from the source. Um, so should we walk us through a little bit of how you would actually decide how to place this array? Would it make sense to put it, for example, on the north side here? Uh, there's some space somewhere out here, or is it yeah. better to put it here on Ideally, the south side? And th this is. Uh, Ideally, south side, um, if there was space, um, particularly in that parking lot, the container we try to get as close to the load panel of the building or the where the larger energy demand needs would be inside the the building. So yeah, somewhere near near the the main load panel, or if they're running extension cords through windows, right, and doing it as a kind of completely off grid system. We we place the container as, as close to the 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 energy load needs as possible. Um, the can the the array can be you know can be separated right. It doesn't it can be a couple hundred feet or longer as long as the the wiring is you know basically people aren't driving over the wires. So that's so it's something to consider if there's movement on the site or or larger trucks coming in and out. But um, we'd drop the, install the solar array as close to the container as possible. And then we can use uh, solar irradiance maps or, you know, there's a bunch of tools online when you're on site to just assess kind of, you know, where the best place for the array would be based on, you know, buildings or the time of the year where the sun's coming out. So we'd kind of move it around based on where on site the, the best, um, sun hours, so where we'd get the most hours of sun per day, um, and try to set it up there. A lot of times, we that's a you know secondary to where it's physically possible to set it up, right? So if there's if there's rubble or other um, infrastructure concerns that we you know might be the best place for the for the panels to set up, but it, if you physically can't get them there, it doesn't really matter, right? So or we, as part of the planning scenario, it could be, you know, we need bulldozers here now to level this so that we can set this up. So we can exactly. start involving other types of professionals in the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the nice thing about having the, the kind of a, a flexible range of um, portable to larger, you know, towable or containerized um energy you know solar generator systems or microgrids is that you can you know you can deliver those 20 power packs and get the the rooms up and running for eight to 12 hours while you're figuring out kind of where the larger um, microgrid system is going to sit that can recharge those batteries um, or power up the the <laughs> hospital itself if that's feasible and we're using publicly available images from years ago but if uh people were really interested they could take current satellite imagery and we could be using the current satellite imagery and make this more realistic yeah or they you can have somebody on the ground just taking a, a photograph of this area and posting it through the uh, request form that we're going to talk about later too so that's kind of a whatever is available really and, and actually one other thing since we're talking about the location of the container close to the power we know inside the building, which we'll be showing you later a little bit more, but we know that the electrical room is on the uh, the east side of the building right here. See where this is the footprint of the building because we've documented and we'll explain this in a little bit how we document it. So it seems like 
it makes sense to put it here if it fits there. That's just my assessment, but we'll jump in here. But that's, and totally. then you were saying, yeah, okay. And then, Good. I mean, the other option is if that roof, if let's say the hospital has a roof access and you can, you know, some hospital, we, we don't know this, right? But it's possible that you could set up the, the array on the roof of the hospital and, and run the wiring down. You just need to, to you know, haul, either get the panels up there or, or uh, crane them up. But it's not, not impossible to set up a, um, the system on the roof. More likely for speed and convenience, it would be in that parking lot next to the, yeah. the um, area. Yeah, so from Google Earth, we can see this roof has some flat area there. It's a eight or nine story building, it looks like. Um, so we could decide before you get there. That's an option, basically, you're saying. So that's good. And then yeah. asset management wise, if that's going to be the decision, then eight stories worth of wiring is necessary. And that needs to be part of the plan. And understanding this ahead of time can help package right. the right materials, the right assets so that they can be effective. Totally. It's a lot of wire, a lot of copper. Yeah. So should we put more arrays here? It seems like, or another container, or maybe we should duplicate this array. Is that okay? It's, yeah. I mean, if we had, it really comes down to triaging resources and, you know, based on the size of that annex and what they're trying to power, if there was available, you know, duplicated, if we have 10 microgrids sitting in the port, right, that were just delivered, and this was the critical, you know, uh, this is where patient needs are the highest, we'd absolutely, you know, double or, or triple the, the drop as much microgrid equipment as, as the space can, you know, support or right. that has physical, you know, space to, to fit. Um, so yeah, if the, the 20, you know, that containerized microgrid with the, the specs that we, we established before the, you know, in the, in the days leading up to this can run at least 10 um, exam rooms 24 seven without kind of breaking a sweat, so to speak. But if they were trying to power up the entire building, that's where you'd really need to look at multiplying the, the containers. So duplicating or, or um, adding more of those next to it or finding a different energy system, right? Like a, like a, um, you know, with some of the, the other units that I think you'll be talking about later, you know, in the megawatt scale to, yes, to run the right. whole, whole building. Um, but if right. there's thank also- you. Thank if you for mentioning that, Will. We're yeah. trying to scale things up to let people uh, comprehend. Totally. Yeah, and it can go, I mean, we're what we're really talking about and it's it can be challenging to kind of envision, but it's helpful having these maps here and the, the, the BIM structure, but it's, you know, anything from a, a portable suitcase size system up to a, you know, 40 foot container, that's a wide range of energy storage and, and output. So at that containerized level, you can really get into to, to infrastructure scale power. Um, at the portable structure, you know, level, you're, you're looking at um, cell phones, light, um, LED lighting and Wi-Fi, right? But the container, you can start talking about HVAC, you know, room building, building lighting, fans, heat pumps, that type of stuff. Yeah, and it's kind of a mixture of types of assets. So you even I noticed you had a Tesla battery here too. Um, so one other comment here on this quick layout that we did, uh, we moved it to the the right side here because the energy is on the inside of the building and we said okay let's see if we can fit 20 kilowatt arrays here but there is we also have to like you kind of alluded to we need to plan for the future from a planning perspective how do we allow more space um, for future expansion sorry there's a noise in the background um, and um, there we go okay so the, I lost my train of thought here for a second. <laughs> um, uh, maybe the, uh, just go ahead and start showing the spaces and- Yeah, that's uh, where I was gonna jump into next, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but 
but we intentionally moved these to here to the right side so we have still space in the parking lot for the gen set units that are going to come in next hopefully but let's go into the interior and mark maybe do you want to show your slides i showed this already a little bit i will i'll go back to this live view here but why don't you explain mark is an architect and that's one thing that's important here that we're as a, I'm, a, I'm an architect as well too we understand how buildings and assets kind of come together, but it's also difficult sometimes to quickly get a layout like this in place. What's a typical clinic looking like? So there's a, a set of data in the background and tools in the background that have all these pieces in place that say a typical exam room has this. And then a lot of times buildings don't have accurate floor plans or even any plans available. So we have to use what's available to quickly come up with a, this is what it looks like. So, so let me uh, give a little bit of a background to this. Kimon has done extensive work for the uh, VA and for the Department of Defense Health uh, System. And he has created digital twins of typical healthcare rooms. So it's not just the room, but it's the equipment that's in it, the um, energy requirements, the other information about these assets. So in previous BIM storms, we've gone through the exercise of creating um, healthcare systems, even airports, by just clicking on these preset templates like it's an Amazon shopping cart. I want seven of these, I want five of these, I want two of these, and I want 10 of those. Then this is where the expertise of Mark Giuliani and his architecture comes in. Because anyone, a doctor can just click on them and say, this is what we need for a good clinic. But then an architect needs to come in and lay them out properly. So go ahead, Kimon and Mark. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Okay, so um, Kimon's showing on the screen right there what we basically came out with as the floor plan, but I can walk through pretty quickly and just using the tools that we used, determine and kind of show everyone, you know, here, this is kind of repetitive. Here's oh, the site. One second, Mark, uh, let yeah. me highlight you. There we go. Thank you. Okay, you can go okay. ahead. So this is a little repetitive. It's just uh, what we um, were going over before about the site, but Essentially, what we did was we looked at uh, this clinic and we looked at the 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 kind of uh, shape of the clinic and we determined by what we thought the spaces would be that would be needed to get everything up and running. So we started to go through these spaces that are part of the database that Camones created and we thought of it as if we were a patient. If we're a patient, we show up at the clinic, what are we going to want to do? The first thing we're going to want to do is really come to a reception area. We're going to want to check in. So these components are already pre-built. We then would arrive at a waiting area. We would wait our turn. Uh, there'd be a public restroom next to the waiting area. Then there would be the exam rooms. And so when we get to the plan, you'll notice that we kind of kept the spaces separate, the administrative space, the back of house space from the public space, those people going to the clinic for help. And so with those, you also, at the administrative space, you start to have file rooms and work rooms and secure storage for the files. And the staff needs a lounge for their break periods. And you need to have cold storage for all of the uh, different types of medicine that are being stored there to administer to the patients. There needs to be a restroom that's somewhat private from the patient restroom. You need to have storage and shelving for all the different things that go on there lockers for the personnel uh, on call room for those doctors that might have to be on call overnight and then of course the typical things that you would have in any facility a mechanical and electrical room battery charging station waste and recycle Cycle. room and a computer and server room so when we go to the 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 final floor plan what you see is that we laid it out basically with plan north being the administrative space and plan south being the patient space and then we moved on plan east we moved the mechanical and electrical spaces where most of the power would be going to over to a space where the site had an open area 
to, to so these microgrids could be brought in and share and that electricity had a place to happen outside where we weren't necessarily blocking the parking lot to the south um but we would utilize the roof and whatever areas we could for the solar panels and the batteries and everything that are there on the outside would be in these alcoves or these open kind of park areas that we that we came across on the site very thoughtful so that's that's essentially walking through the plan and how we got there um i know that most of one thing i would add mark is that um you're kind of describing how to design this but we're also if you were talking to the staff on site and they had this was an existing facility they might have said all of our exam rooms are on the south side here and we have our mechanical room on the right just on the phone or whatever and from your architectural experience you could have quickly lay it out well this is approximately what it looks like so we're kind of having two different scenarios one is we need to renovate it but another one is we need to assess what's there right now quickly to be able to say yeah there's six exam rooms here and the uh, mechanicals on the right the assets for the mechanical are on the right side and right and what we what we try to do is make it as modular as possible so that if these could be prefabricated off site because of the conditions on site they could be brought in on the backs of trucks and as modular as you have with modular buildings or homes or prefab fabricated units they could be brought in and placed inside the building great and the assets inside the room like we talked about earlier with will knowing that they're in a typical exam room there's certain pieces of equipment that need power and what the um, specifications are of those equipment based on these kind of uh, preset parts that can be adjusted too but getting within range is important quickly. And that was the exercise here. So this scenario is, do we renovate this damaged clinic? Do we uh, build a new one uh, outside of this building or do we uh, abandon it and just try something completely different in another another building, for example? So that's kind of the, the quick uh, assessment that needs to happen uh, based on what's on the ground there. Right, and so by, th- we don't know until we get there, but by the by the uh, by designing this in such a fashion that it's modular, by working with the uh, different contractors to have these things prefabricated off site, then you can bring these units in. They're scalable. If you need more space, one type of space like an exam room, then other types of space, then you can bring those in. As if the clinic becomes more crowded. You can then uh, move some of the spaces outside the clinic and put them in temporary structures. So for instance, the waiting room or the check-in and such like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So maybe I could switch screen again back to the live site and get back to exercise. So we need so more what... energy. We need more energy because it's been great to have the headlamps in a couple of the rooms powered. But uh, now we need to bring in uh, John Arnup and say, how can we get a mobile container here? Exactly. So let's so, jump back outside of this clinic building. Oh, so John, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And um, John has been working with Kimon uh, leading up to this. Uh, workshop. And uh, John, will you tell a little bit about uh, um, your experience with microgrids uh, through ports and uh, the development of your green ammonia generator that's uh, got a couple of patents on? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, I know we've been discussing. So if you kind of looked at a, a port, they are in in somewhat a, a bit of a, their own microgrid fed by a, a utility. Um, and obviously even in the US you have uh, um, cranes within the port that are still powered by their own generator, um, similar, not dissimilar to what you see on the screen. So you have kind of a mini microgrid uh, within the terminal uh, microgrid itself. Um, and then you have uh, people at, at ports completely disconnected from that are powered up uh, in in full by a, a generator set. So um, so lots of various uh, 
sort of terminal powering grid networks, depending on, on uh, where you are in, in the world. In terms of um, generators, I mean, we did have a, a quite a bit of experience in Africa in, in putting in diesel generator sets. So that's one thing. As a, as a copy paste aesthetically, the ammonia um, set that we, we ha are developing and have developed one type of engine is, a, is an internal combustion engine that runs 100% uh, on ammonia. So that was a, a world first because a lot of ammonia has been used on internal combustion engines in the past, but always with another fuel to, to get the burning process started. So we do with our UK partners, LATAC, uh, we have the LATAC generator set, which um, is in progress. We have two filed patents on that. Um, and that's what we're developing. So we've got a, a small generator set the engine um, that's done that's going for CE certification um, early Q1 next year. And then we're already started on the development of a much bigger engine, um, of which then we start really talking about powering um, buildings and equipment. And we start to get up to that 1,000, 2,000, and, and even a 5,000 watt kilowatt um, unit. So that, that's where we are on the on the generator set. Of course, they're all um, in containers, uh, whether it's a diesel or, or our ammonia or others. Um, so very, very easy to ship around the world and deploy on road systems and trucks into, uh, you know, wherever your location, i.e. this um, this hospital scenario that we're looking in there, Kharkiv. Great. So if we use all of these assets that you just described and we continue with the scenario that we were planning earlier, that's where we are next, right? Can we move on to that? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So we left off with Will with a, uh, two arrays, containerized units there, and we have the hospital annex that's partially powered, I guess, at this point based on the assets that are brought in. There might be more need in the main building. It looks like we have some space in the parking lot here, and there's still some space here to the south, uh, and maybe even to the north, but we have uh, the assets that you're describing mapped down here. So we have the ammonia units you're describing up there. And we want to just move these in. So you have the two regular genset units, one megawatt, two megawatt, and then ammonia units, uh, one, two, and three. Actually, just one and two. This is a duplicate already, isn't it? Yeah, we already started duplicating it here. So we have these assets here. So what should we do? Maybe you should walk us through what you would do in this scenario. What would be your recommendation? Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, interesting, come on, when I was watching uh, earlier, obviously, with William, um, because I, you could see two parallel uh, journeys going on. One was the, the William, you know, when you're looking at that hypothetical scenario is to get the building active uh, in small parts, depending on the condition. But in parallel, you would obviously um, have people going into the building to properly assess it. Um, so in terms of a, a risk assessment, the, the functional assessment. And so by the time that you, uh, the speed in which William would be able to mobilize power in, in parts, the assessment would uh, determine, you know, the functionality of, of that wing, that hospital wing. And so on, on the basis that the hospital wing then becomes functional, then you can talk about bringing in the, the the generator set. So whether it's a diesel, of course, you have the supply. Whether it's ammonia, you also have the supply. We know they fit into 40-foot containers, so you can quite easily um, decide uh, where they sit here. And I think William's already talked about connecting into the, um, the hospital electrical infrastructure. Um, so, and that will all come out in a, in a risk assessment on the, in a parallel journey to that emergency uh, 
uh, go live, if you like. Um, and for the fueling, I mean, obviously you have uh, diesel, so that would all run simultaneously again because you've got whether it's uh, ammonia, which is all ammonia is um, one of the most shipped chemicals in the transported chemicals in the world, so it's not new. Um, and so we talked about a T50 tank, which is a very standard LPG tank in a 20 um, foot frame. So all of those can come on on ships alongside the generators and the buildings that you're bringing in. Uh, the T50 tank can be safely um, stored in a convenient location. It can be trucked in to refuel the genset. Um, so that that's really uh, that that's really how I, how I saw this. You know, watching you earlier with uh, with William and and seeing that parallel. Uh, risk assessment and functional assessment of that wing, and then um, and then bringing the the supply chain, the fuel, uh, whatever fuel that is, um, and the generator set, and, uh, and and really where that sits is what William said. It's just the closer you are to the the electrical panel, if uh, for want of a better expression, the better. Okay. So if we have this, uh, I just moved this T fifty tank in here. Are you suggesting that we have? a T50 and a Genset one or two ammonia in here? Yeah, so, I mean, let's, let's just uh, say, so the Genset, so let, we've got T50 tanks. Now that, if you finished the assessment of the, of the wing um, and you had a demand in there that you wanted, you would bring in the Gensets um, and you would connect them um, as necessary in parallel to give you the power that you would need to, to power up that entire wing. So let's just assume, let's just say hypothetically they were four megawatt. And, and so you would bring in either four one megawatt or two two megawatt um, gensets. You'd drop them uh, on the land. They're on a 40 foot container. So you don't need um, uh, you know anything particularly special. Um, you would know the fuel consumption, whether that's a diesel or whether it's ammonia. Um, you know you can ship a, a, a T50 in with ammonia. That needs to be uh, positioned strategically within the town or the city um, in, a, in a safe way. And they're all on trailers. And so you drop the gensets in and you plug them in, and then the T50 supply chain just comes in uh, wherever you decide safely to, um, to store those in between the refueling. And then that whole supply chain then is just uh, is obviously built into your scenario planning and getting that fuel in and out. Mm -hmm. So would it make sense to park these close to the power source that we identified earlier? I mean, the, uh, yeah, um, I mean, I, I think ideally, yes. I mean, I think everybody maybe understands that you obviously get power loss on long cables. So um, so when you're close to the, the, the feed, that that's ideal um, but again it just comes down to the size so if you are distant and you're going across roads I think there's plenty of temporary um, safeguards that you can have in terms of running you see in rock concerts and what, what have you where how they cover sort of electric cables for whether it's foot or, or vehicle crossing over but ideally close to the building um, but you know mission critical it, it, it's not um, but that's an ideal yes yeah, so in this scenario layout here, if we initially with Will, we basically were powering part of the first floor or the clinic of the first floor with these assets here. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to power the additional floors in this annex, it might make sense to bring in dense sets here. Uh, if we in the future want to possibly power part of the main hospital, then maybe it goes here, maybe it gets too crowded here. Maybe we have to suggest to Will, can you move these arrays yeah. further away, something like that. Um, or we might even need another site for the main hospital up here. Um, yeah, and this would all come out in, in any um, risk assessment and function assessment when you can understand how the power is all coming into these hospitals. And then you would already have pre-planned um, how, you know, how many gensets you're going to connect together in parallel, uh, how many gen set farms if you like uh, are going to be needed maybe it is two like you said and you'd have one on the other hospital um and, and the other one on the, the hospital wing mm -hmm. and then you would just match that fuel supply um 
to that. So you'd have kind of almost like a, a fuel farm, you know, whatever fuel you're using, but let's just say we're using ammonia, then you would you would have that all plugged into the supply chain and uh, and that would be coming in on container ships and shipped up into your kind of ammonia farm, if you like. Okay. So maybe I'd misunderstood on the LP T50 tank. Is that for delivering the fuel to these to yeah. refuel them? Okay, so, so this is kind of a mobile unit that needs to get in and out to yeah. and get well, access. What to I say on the ISO because these are standard ISO design uh, LPG type tanks. Uh, so everybody mm -hmm. knows LPG. They uh, store ammonia and LPG the same at thirty bar. So um, so these are just standard tanks that sit within a frame that is twenty foot that is can like a container. So it's containerized, it can go on a container uh, ship. This one here that you've got on the right hand side in the middle. So that is a, a, a T50 uh, tank. Um, and that is what uh, can be used. Um, and so these are off the shelf, if you like, and containerized so they can be put onto a road truck um, and trucked up into the, the country. Uh, they can put on container ships and, and so on and so forth. So these are highly mobile. Um, whether it's on sea or, or on the road. And, uh, and again, you just match that supply to, the to how much fuel you need to keep going. Yeah, okay, that's great. That's good info. So in that scenario, we need to make sure there's a way for this, first of all, for these gensets to have road access so you can get this T50 in there to refuel them. How, and how often would they have to be refueled? Um, so you yeah. wouldn't want to landlock them somewhere where it's hard to get to and you and you want yeah. them as close as possible to the building but it looks like there's some kind of a road system here so maybe yeah. maybe this place makes sense here but maybe. i think uh, so come on come on they're, they're actually going to stay there the, and the, yeah, the, the fuel stays in them and supplies the gen sets as they need the fuel and then a yeah, delivery the, truck will either come and resupply that tank or they'll right. just swap the tanks out no, that's correct. No, you, the the fuel uh, system is within the uh, the engine pod, the generator pod, if you like. So these tanks come on the back of trucks and refuel. So just as you would with a diesel. So a diesel genset would have diesel within it, um, and then you would just keep topping it up. So again, this comes back down to um, your risk assessment uh, and your planning. And uh, you know, under what we all do so well under the asset management guise, is that you would size these because the tanks can be what you want. So you would look at your access roads, your the, the difficulty or the ease, and you would be able to size these up to suit. If you want these to run 24 hours um, before and you're filling once a day, that's exactly what you size up and bring in. So you can you can modify that based on the type of truck movement you want to come in and around this hospital so so from a maintenance perspective these units are you probably have sensors and monitors on them already but then you also have people on the ground that would do something to them right to maintain them or make sure they're fueled or make sure they're powering or uh, if they go down and something critical is attached to them how do you track that so for example if this unit is supporting an icu unit Mm -hmm. in the main hospital and they're in the middle of an operation what happens uh, if this unit goes down that, that type of scenario kind of... yeah so you you would always have to build redundancy uh, into the system wouldn't you if you decided to power up that if you decided after the the risk and functional assessment that you wanted to power up and you needed x amount of power you would bring in x amount of generator with a redundancy because you'd have to bring one offline um, either should it ever fail, but generally for maintenance and, and stuff like that. So, so you would bring in what you would need to include a downtime function for some sort of maintenance. And that, again, that would all come into your, your risk scenario at the end of the day. And you right. could be powering batteries, um, the generator, you know, if there was excess power so that if it went down, there could be some battery backup. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if 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 they had the worst case scenario, you would still have Williams kind of um, systems in there. So if if the really the worst case ever, ever happened, which is what makes it a microgrid. Well, correct. Yeah, correct. 
and the and the L and the T fifty tank came on. I mean, th those would normally um, be strategically positioned somewhere not close to the the building. Um, so, oh, okay. We 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 have um, and actually they're, they're one of the biggest ones. The biggest voices is Hills Brothers in the U.S., uh, where they do like strategic planning in terms of uh, strategy around storage and delivery of of things like ammonia. So again, you'd have many little parallel functions going on where you would be analyzing this uh, immediate area for strategic storage uh, and delivery, um, you know, functionality, risk assessment of what is in that um, building there. And then you would start sizing up while William is already in uh, and got it running. And then uh, the longer term fix then would come in through those little um, uh, workshop sort of assessments that you're doing, if you get what I mean. Yeah. So you're yeah. saying that this would be, this is a movable truck, right? So you don't want to park it nearby yeah. here. Just, you want to be far away here. Then when yeah, you need exactly. it, it comes in, it fuels, and it goes back and parks in the designated uh, absolutely. service area. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. And, and rather than risk. have, and you may have two or three um, locations. So rather than have them all in one location, again, that would come out in your risk management uh, where you would decide how much you need and how many would you store uh, in in kind of what car parts or areas and, and then transport them in. But they are just on standard road trailers. Well, yeah. we're talking about all of these containerized units. They need to come in through a port. And we don't know if the port's operating. So let's take this microgrid scenario to a port and let John share some of his expertise about ports. Uh, Kimon, are you are you you ready to? Do uh, yeah, that? I need one more minute, but yeah, that's a that's a good next step. Definitely, we're telling the story here. In fact, this color coding here that we're seeing, green means that it's here in on site. Red means that it's in transit. So we're just simulating. Do we have space to bring these from the port into here? Um, and before, and actually, one more question before we leave that. So we have a mixture of ammonia and diesel here. Is that okay to mix them like that? Yeah, I assume it's yeah okay. it is fine. They were just um, scenarios, uh, Kimon. So I mean, it's absolutely fine. Uh, and I think the message, uh, you know, today, given what is available um, today, is that when you are in a kind of hypothetical emergency scenario like we're talking uh, here is that it doesn't have to be uh, a dirty fuel it doesn't have to be a fossil fuel fixture there are options now where you truly can bring a zero emission emergency scenario to play um, and of course you're in an area around a hospital where zero emission might be really quite relevant. Um, so, you know, and that is all available um, today where maybe a few years ago it certainly wasn't. Um, so these are just scenarios where, you know, whether you're using a fossil fuel or, or a zero emission um, genset. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so we're gonna turn these that are in transit. I, I pulled up the attribute here and say, we're gonna deploy them. Just, we're going to change the marker just so because in our reports we start to see this so we're going to deploy it in Kharkiv and change that setting so everything turns green so green means they're on site now there's a few more stray ones out here like the EV charging and the power pack that uh, we didn't go through but that's okay probably unless there's something here and then also this uh, truck here will say it's deployed as well and the next we're going to go to the port and talk about how they get from the port to here um, and then oh, while we're here, then if we look in our report now for this site, it's in the background, all this data is getting updated. So we're seeing which, which things are deployed, what they are, uh, how much energy they're generating, how much is being consumed. By. So each of these rows is uh, like uh, uh, the, the annex building is here. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't have the exact con consumption number here, but we can fill that in later. We can even edit it here. So this is what this, this idea of a digital twin is that there's many different users that some want to look at a list like this, others want to be able to uh, make a decision here, or others want to go inside the building and see the actual layout like Mark talked about and seeing the assets. And our next scenario is let's go to the port and see how all this gets delivered to the port and makes its way here. And oh, then we also have a report on the cost estimate. It still needs updating, but we have uh, a live report as well on 
co individual cost of these items, which uh, Will and John gave us uh, as far as kind of a rough rule of thumb of what's the actual cost of the asset um, as we look at different parts of it right here. And this is an important part of the asset management element of, of this and actually asset leadership. We need leaders to require this type of information management system to be deployed for the management of their assets. We're using this extreme scenario of uh, uh, reconstructing Ukraine, but this type of seamless information flow between different software programs using an open, secure um, uh, standards are critical in meeting the needs of uh, advanced organizations. Yeah, and we're even feeding it out to an API. So it's reading off the data into a Google Sheet here with an API from our server. So the concept is that you don't wanna be stuck in any one system. You wanna be able to see this information in many different views. This is basically giving a roll up in a completely different application, even though it's coming from this other server here and this server is looking, using a lot of other different sources. So using this kind of open source API, web API connections for a digital, the digital twin is not a single application. It's a lot of, a lot of confusion in the industry that digital twin equals one application where you put everything into, and that just doesn't scale. Um, okay, so let's move to Odessa, right? So we are gonna leave uh, let's see if I have a lot of windows here open now. Let's get see if I can. And you have your camera off. Is that on purpose? Oh, sorry. No, I turned it off earlier. Yeah, I'll turn my camera back on. Oh, there we go. And while you're getting yourself uh, organized there, I'm just going to talk about a little bit of what's coming up. Um, Art Curlin from University Health is online. And after we get done with the port here, um, Art is going to be talking about uh, healthcare personal property asset management and how that can be applied to this uh, emergency scenario that we're, we're talking about. That's coming up shortly. Yep, great. So Art's in San Antonio, so we have actually a, a plan here for San Antonio. Um, but yeah, we're zooming out from Kharkiv now, Kharkiv to the north um, east here. It's actually a, a lot going on there right now. Uh, and and then before we're in you click, um, there is um, Mykolov is uh, just uh, north and east of uh, uh, Odessa. You don't have to click there, but uh, John has actually done work at that port, and that port is currently closed. And we had some scenarios for over there, but for time limits, we're just going to be uh, talking about uh, Odessa. Yeah. But I just want to say how real this can get. Mm -hmm. So here we are in Odessa. There's a port facility out here and we click on that dot, the digital twin dot, like we talked about earlier. We drill into it if we want to see more about it. And what we've done here is we moved that whole set of assets into the port in Odessa. We left Kharkiv as is, we, we deployed it there, but now we're at the port in Odessa and we have the containers, we have cranes, um, we have uh, the need to be, del to be delivered somewhere like we talked about earlier. The gen sets are here ready to ready at the port, but they need to be, we're basically cataloging them as they come in and then deciding where they go. Uh, and in fact, here are what um, Mike mentioned earlier about uh, the hospital in San Antonio. We had a, a separate BIM storm where we actually had uh, healthcare pods that have equipment in them that are ready at port too. They were shipped here in our, in our plant scenario. Are containerized healthcare units that have been assembled in this um, way when we did the 2020 uh, BIM storm at a distance um, um, using uh, Art Curlin's University Health as the site. Yeah, there, there's a bunch of containerized units actually documented here. So the one from Art's scenario is here. It's a, called a CuraPod. It's actually an open source design that was put out for the COVID response. It's a 20 foot container packed with equipment uh, and it's ready. And so that this block here basically represents six of those. And if I jumped in the details, I would get down to the individual assets inside that pod. And that's what's 
interesting about this is as we're moving things around, it's carrying around all those assets as we're doing this planning scenario. So John, why don't you walk us through what I found fascinating, which I learned just last week from you about the port, about how cranes and, and microgrids work together. I had no idea um, the dynamic between that, but there's a lot more to this, but go ahead, you tell us the story. Yeah, uh, so th yeah, thanks, come on. Yeah, in terms of a scenario for, the, uh, for, the, for this port, I mean, well, let's work on two, and uh, because there has to be an upfront assessment um, before you start. So somebody has to, to walk in here and assess the situation. Now, currently these cranes, um, and, and let's I zoom in and look, but I'm pretty sure they'll be running from the electrical grid. So they provide, you know, these are electrically powered from the utility company. Um, and and so when, so they will generate power uh, as well as consume it as well. Um, so when they're in the lowering cycle, uh, electricity will will be generated and it will flow back into the terminal grid and it will be picked up uh, whatever is sat on that terminal grid. So if we were walking in on this scenario, you would have to assess the, the situation, the condition uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, and so if the terminal grid for scenario one was intact, then the generator sets would not sit by the crane. Um, you would move those up near the substation and you would, uh, let's just say the utility provider has been knocked out, but the terminal grid is intact, then the gen sets would sit with the, uh, with the substation and you would be able to connect you would understand the load quickly per crane um, and uh, and for the buildings and so on and so forth. So, so that would be relatively uh, straightforward in scenario one. Um, scenario two would be if the, the utility provider has been taken out um, or not functioning, and then you had the terminal uh, grid, uh, which was uh, incomplete or, or or not functioning properly, of which point you would need to um, power up the cranes directly. So obviously some technical things to, to, to put in place, but a gen set to power up the crane, uh, which we have done um, in Southeast Asia temporarily, even though they weren't designed for that. So bringing in a generator set, bringing in a load bank and being able to technically assemble those to allow that crane to function like a proper crane. Um, so that would be very like a little mini microgrid on the crane um, and then have parts of the terminal. So, so in a worst case scenario, you would have generators and load banks on the crane. You would have a, a, a reefer power pack, which is a generator with reefer plugs. So quite common. Um, so you would containerized. Uh, so you would be able to bring those in and plug in reefers for medical supplies, food and what have you. Um, best case scenario is for the grid to be working and you plug the generator set and then really the terminal works not, uh, uh, as a whole and, uh, and efficiently, making use of this regenerated power. Yeah, very interesting. So what you just described is basically this, right? You'd have the gen sets that have a microgrid that are tied directly to the cranes or if the substation is functioning, then you would move a gen set here near the substation and then the reefer is just to, uh, the reefer is the refrigerated unit, right? Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's right, Kim. On so the the they're refrigerated containers, and they have a yeah. dedicated place normally in the yard. So if the yard was functioning correctly, or if the electrical grid was intact, then you they would just plug in in the normal way. But if yeah. you were having issues, you could still separate and have a, a dedicated reefer they call it a reefer power pack so it's a generator with like 20 30 40 plugs in it mm -hmm. so you just literally drop them on the ground and plug a bunch of containers uh, refrigerated containers in so that's quite flexible 
Okay, in great. Way. So in the first scenario is we bring a gen set next to each of the cranes, right? That's scenario that one. That would be the worst case if you were, worst case. if the yeah. grid had been uh, damaged in any way, um, where you had to yeah. connect to the source, then that's the worst case scenario. A, because you need a lot of assets, there's a, you'd need a, a, a stronger technical solution to get the cranes. Um, but of course, it's all been done before, so not, not an issue. Yeah. So that from the satellite view, we can see where the cranes are, but we don't know where the substation is. So that would be one of the discussions in the next scenario is if we want to bring the gen set and cook it up to the substation, we have to find a substation yeah. either by looking around or getting somebody on a meeting and saying, where is a substation? Because we need to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So probably if you were spending a bit of time on Google, you'd be able to see it and there may be more than one anyway. So um, yeah. So, so let's say it's let's just pretend it's out here. So we mm. plug the gen sets out here. So that's another scenario. And then, you, yeah, you'll have substations that yeah, may be responsible for delivering power to different things. So um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the other one that we're going to transition to next to is about these cura pods that came in from San Antonio that came in on a delivery that came off the container. They're going to be delivered to Kharkiv. So they're parked here temporarily and also wills units also came in here too the containerized yeah. units which could be used here or moved to kharkiv so you'd have kind of a staging area of uh, things that are happening here yeah and well actually my, uh, come on uh, what's interesting there i mean if, if the you've got those where you see rtgc the, the rubber tired gantry crane so these are container stacks so if all of this is functioning and just say your your servicing the the worst cities first Kharkiv yeah um, but say you're servicing 20 cities and you've got a lot of containers coming in you would be able to drop the the pods the classrooms the medical center refrigerator containers the gen sets all of those would just be dropped from the big crane onto a truck into the yard here offloaded and mm -hmm. stored and so, yeah. uh, and from there, you would be able to collect it on a road truck and drive it to the town or city or village that you're looking to drop it off on. So that's yeah. where all of this can, as long as it's containerized, is where it would sit. Um, and however many cities you're serving, that you'd fill the yard up, I guess. Yeah, definitely. In fact, these are the containers that you mentioned to us. Yeah. Uh, so they just the different it, three types. Yeah, right exactly. There. Correct. Yeah. So they, those are the contain exactly the same thing, 20 and 40 foot. So those would just that would be the gen set, your your classroom, your your temporary medical room and so on and so forth. Right. Exactly. Well, and that gives just, a, a really good understanding. Uh, but come on, you had another question. No, I just want to reinforce again that these uh, larger units here, they're shown, shown deployed, but they would come in on a container. We need both so we can plan where it lands. And it's the same thing with these prefab. In fact, we have a prefab participant too that's not here today, but about classrooms, um, Dara Dharaji's. Um, he's doing work with prefab units. So how do you containerize different types of buildings, land them on the, um, the site, and then deploy them to wherever they need to go? Yeah. Because, yeah, and the beauty of anything that you can containerize is that you, you're you using standard infrastructure um, like road trailers, road trucks. So you're not, you've got no complications on, on that side of it. Exactly, yeah. And, and the other thing I thought about when I was watching you come on and um, talk through uh, in the hospital side, you know, we, you do have the, the grain silos here. Um, so which are probably export, but if you're looking to get the country uh, working, you know, where you could, um, again, take in the, the food product side uh, and to see, so the, the parallel journeys that I, uh, scenarios that I could see taking place would be to, to locate these um, suppliers, uh, you know, because you'll probably need spare parts. I should, I should imagine that some of these will be, maybe in not such good shape, I don't know. But then you've got the people feeding into this grain terminal, which will be up into the country. So these will be on the farmlands, uh, the, the, you know, the people there, which will have their own silo. So there is a connect where you would have to find out who is feeding these silos. Um, do they come by truck or train, you know, and go through that supply chain back into Ukraine itself um, and make sure that you're providing the energy 
in that scenario there, all the way through that supply chain to those silos to get onto the ship and start trading again, if you like, if you want to get the country not only back on its feet, but also back trading. So, so I, I thought that was another scenario, you know, where you could use everything that we've been working on, you know, in terms of containerized solutions, et cetera. Right, definitely. Yeah, that's kind of the, the beauty of having kind of access that's, that's, to open open maps like this to yeah, see exactly, what yeah. what your what your surrounding is, and then but then tying it to specific geometry, so you can even say, well, let's move it. You know, maybe you need the gen set down here, or whatever. Is there a space here? There? So it, it kind of goes on forever if you have this yeah. kind of and and then to do it rapidly. And what we found over the years too is it's if we're all on kind of a these digital twins with common understanding and we're seeing it on the screen versus just seeing a list, then you get much quicker reaction. That's our experience as architects too. When you start sketching yeah. ideas of a building or a site out, you get yeah. you get to decisions much faster, more accurate, yeah. risk-free decisions. Yeah. Because on here, come on, if you think of your what you're doing on the BIM, your BIM would include, uh, just take the silos for example, you, it's all encompassed within the, the kind of the terminal microgrid say, mm -hmm. but uh, 200 miles up into the country, somebody is uh, it has is farming the grain and putting it into the silos, putting it into the trucks and shit. Now you'd capture all of that, so you would capture kind of a, a another microgrid that's connected to this one um, as part of a supply chain to get a country um, just trading again and and farming. Right, exactly. Yeah. So here we are at the port now with our scenarios that we just set up actually with the gen sets set up here the containers uh and then we started looking and this is in google earth now but we landed the digital twin there um and we have the silos here uh and then what you're describing is from a map like this you might say okay in fact you can do with google right you can start saying how do i get to this farm over here or how do i get right. to this other community exactly. it's, it's all here basically yeah that's exactly and, right yeah, yeah. So it's quite interesting how you can link uh, parts of the country um, that are very relevant and very needy of each other um, uh, through the, the BIM. So it's it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one so thing I'd like to make. This um, is fascinating. Um, I'll go ahead, Kimo, but then we do need to move on. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, one point I'd like to make is back to the, the concept of the, uh, the digital twin. Notice that this clinic that we showed earlier has a lot more detail in it. We intentionally keep it simplified here, but the data, the asset data is still linked in here. So you can literally go in and drill into individual assets if you want to, but it's really good, important to have the proper level of information that allows us to do this quick, large scale and then zoom into the details, constantly zooming in and zooming out. It's not always highly detailed models because all of a sudden you're carrying a lot of baggage. So, so modularizing ideas, whether it's, it's actually very similar to how containers work, right? You kind of simplify, you put it in a box, you move the box around with stuff inside in the container. Same thing with, with digital twins. How do we become as efficient as possible to work like that? Okay, let's move on. So, excellent. Thank you so much, John and Kimon. If you would like to, uh, uh, take a break, get some water or something. Um, I will introduce uh, Art Curlin and we'll start talking about uh, what we did there and the importance of asset management for these types of activities. And then uh, Kimon, you can come back on and uh, we can talk a little bit about the models that you created. So Art, uh, are you able to join us? Uh, welcome from San Antonio. You're uh, muted still. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. So um, Art is the uh, Capital and Asset Man uh, Director of Capital and Asset Management at the uh, University Health, the first hospital in the world to be ISO 55001 certified and recertified. And I believe you're getting your second recertification. Uh, and uh, so, um, in 2020, we used uh, the um, University Health as the landing point for temporary hospitals to show how to plan temporary uh, hospitals for COVID uh, outbreak. And uh, um, first, I'd like to have you talk about personal 
personal property asset management for healthcare and the important and the benefits that you have seen at University Health. Okay, hello, everyone. Yeah, so um, our role is uh, basically in the accountability of, of personal property uh, and just taking steps to ensure all of our equipment is uh, accounted for and uh, taken care of. Uh, we do that a, a host of ways. Uh, we use a lot of standardization. Um, the benefits that we've received are uh, numerous. Uh, every, everything from uh, being able to reutilize assets and save uh, money uh, from having to purchase assets that, that we, we have excess of. So, and all these are, are, are tracked. Uh, we have the numbers uh, to back it up. Uh, we reduce landfill uh, waste uh, by recycling uh, and also receiving money uh, for recycling. And then finally, you know, we save our clinical staff a, a, a lot of time uh, so they could focus on our patients and not having to worry about personal property issues. Excellent. And that's basically what we're trying to demonstrate is effective in uh, Ukraine. So can you talk about some of the processes that were introduced to help you better track the personal property, the assets in the hospital? Oh. Can you repeat that? What were some of the activities that you had to do to begin tracking? Did you have to introduce a registry of assets? Was it separate for okay, so departments? Um, were they able to feed in central yeah. database? Okay, so I, um, I apologize, but you're, you're kind of coming in and out um, on my end. So, uh, to answer your, your question, what we did was form an asset management uh, governance committee and we defined the asset life cycle as, as far as it pertains to us from you know, acquisition to transfers to, to disposal. And uh, within each of the asset life cycle activities where we defined like seven, uh, we, we also developed processes um, and looked at risks and, and opportunities uh, that occur within those life cycle act, act, um, activities. And so we further kind of defined what our processes um, ought to look like to minimize risks associated with the uh, life cycle uh, phases from acquisition through disposal and uh, we, we, you know, memorialize that in our uh, our corporate policy and our strategic asset management plan, and uh, just uh, implemented uh, our ideas uh, and uh, you know rolled them out company wide and said you know th this is the process for an acquisition, this is the process you know for uh, disposal and everything in, in between. Excellent. So it's uh, similar to what Kimon was saying about having the secure open standards to enable the information flow from multiple different software systems. Yeah. So as far as the personal property um, in this, and I'm, I apologize, I was late. So you may have even spoken to, to some of the things, but yeah, yeah, you know, standardization is key. Um, it, one of the things that might help in, in, in standardizing and, and, and identifying as well. So obviously you need to identify uh, the containers, you know, perhaps serialize them uh, with numbers um, and everything within the containers need to be identified. So one of the processes in the beginning would be to decide what it is that needs to be tracked because, you know, maybe not everything needs to be tracked. So there has to be some thresholds um, talked about uh, to begin with. And, you know, part of the identity uh, and, uh, could be, you know, maybe medical containers are a certain color 
um, you know, a kitchen, a certain color, classrooms, the containers a certain color. So that would help um, when it comes to, um, you know, stacking the containers and easily identifying them, at least in terms of a category, if there was a standardized color of, uh, per container. And then uh, just de again, deciding what's, and the threshold can be, um, you know, a, a monetary or it can be a, a criticality. The, the thresholds can be based on different things, but there should be just some predefined uh, definitions on, on what it is that, that you are, are, are want to track and, and what your acceptable level of, of loss is um, by not tracking. Right. Uh, we did talk a little bit with uh, Will Hegard. He is basically donating uh, uh, solar microgrid generators, and but he needs to provide uh, support. So he needs to have that kind of remote access. So um, then the other thing that was uh, really interesting was working on you with the uh, uh, BIM storm at a distance where we did the scenario um, uh, of creating a temporary hospital out in one of your parking lots. And uh, so Kimon has modeled those. And what we're going to do is show how it's possible to just basically pick them up from San Antonio and land them. We've already seen them on the, the port uh, uh, being delivered, already configured. Of course, they would show up uh, separately. Um, Kimon, are you back? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So if you uh, want to bring up the model of uh, the Cura system, yeah. oh boy, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's we, university. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm rewinding back a couple of years to the beginning of COVID, right? That's when we hit this, uh, this planning scenario, but we uh, found these uh, open source Cura pods, which are 20 foot containers with uh, exam Facility, uh, assets inside it. Can you zoom in? Can you zoom in a little on that? So, yeah. Yeah, so this is a Cura, a single pod. And then with art, we ran through a scenario of planning to put it on University Health. And there was a parking lot, and there's a whole um, video and everything of how we went through this and, you know, plant different planning scenarios. Can we put it on this part of the site where is existing building? And with today's scenario, we're kind of going through quickly, we're jumping around the world, but we walked through with Will and John about moving some of these containers to Texas. So this exact same Kira pod now is right here on the port in Odessa. And this goes back to the discussion about open standards and being able to share information. A lot of the owners that we work with are struggling with even to manage their own, maintain their own facility, building or facility itself. If we get some common understanding, uh, it's a kind of a container idea. Okay, we have a container that's commonly understood how big it is. But if we can share, okay, we need a, a certain type of use, like what Art was describing. Okay, if we color code the exam rooms blue, then we need six exam rooms. Uh, and if we look at the, the backing up to the, 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 uh, the scenario in San Antonio, we have these cure pods, six pods each landed here on the site. And what I've done is I've identified that we can send 12 of these are no longer needed here. So we're gonna pack them up and ship them to Kharkiv. So from San Antonio to Kharkiv, they're marked to go and the other ones we'll keep here. So then that's, that's the scenario that we ran through earlier of how do we place these uh, pods on the exterior of the annex building in Kharkiv next to the hospital there. Um, Went through kind of quickly there, but basically that's that's a scenario. Mike, was there anything else that you'd like to or art comment? No, that, that was it. That was it exactly. Um, so then, art. Uh, let's say those were your pods, and that you sent them to Ukraine. What would the information be that you would want to have uh, uh, about them and and their use? Yeah, so um, again, we would want to know uh, exactly what they were and uh, in terms of what kind of pods, 
what they contained. Uh, and other than that, it would be, not, you know, like you talked about earlier, it would be nice to know the, you know, the costs associated with it and, and all of that. But just on a high level, you know, exactly what equipment was in the pod and that it was uh, accounted for uh, as it was being returned. Okay. So the main yeah. thing is, uh, go ahead, come on. And probably even the condition, if these were in use for two years, there might be some pieces of equipment that were no longer functional. So there might be some pods that are not reusable as much possibly. I'm just guessing here, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so tracking down to that, that's when we get down to the details. Does this analgesia unit still, is still functioning? Having an ID associated with it, being inside a preventive maintenance or work order system or equipment system, knowing that, yes, we can take these out of the 24 pods we have, we can send these six, package them up and send them out for reuse. And I, th I think that was one of the scenarios we talked about two years ago, too, with COVID. We were talking about how do you move this, these assets around to where the demand is, right? So that's the beauty of having them containerize, quickly deploy, but also quickly redeploy. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when they're staged, what's nice is like when they're being staged for deployment, everything could be uh, ready to go inside and, and the doors basically sealed. So you would know if anybody entered them for for any reason and then mm -hmm. so they should the door should be sealed with, upon arrival uh, to give you some confidence that that everything is inside to, as it should All right so the main thing was what art had talked about at the beginning which was the requirements for all departments to be able to provide information for his central asset registry and what we're showing through this demonstration is if the leader of an organization requires that as standard operating procedure, then these types of scenarios and actual planning can occur and uh, rapid uh, reconstruction of re Ukraine or any other mission can be accomplished with a greater level of success. Mm -hmm. Just want to emphasize that part. So, yes. you know, just ha having the processes for the asset life cycle in place and having everyone follow the processes uh, it is makes it very efficient to move very quickly and, and make adjustments very quickly. All right. And so, um, this concludes the workshop activities that we had planned, but I wanted to say something uh, that I, I realized. Uh, Asset Leadership Network and, and much of the world is focused on facility assets. And there's not a whole lot of talk and discussion about the personal property assets that make the facilities actually operate as intended. And it's interesting that these temporary facilities are themselves personal property. Mm -hmm. So it kind of combines facilities and personal property into a mobile clinic and then the actual right. mobile energy units that are powering them. So Mike, can I add, can I add one thing, please, Mike, before, before we close please. out? Um, there was one more site, the Los Angeles City College site, where we basically took, so it's basically reinforcing that these same assets can go anywhere, right? But the reason we're showing this is that in a couple of weeks, we actually have a live session. We're working with LA Community College District. They have 720 buildings. Uh, their space types are classified, I mean, classified by type, so they can search and find, and they have assets inside the building. And uh, it's pretty interesting because they are using uh, a work orders and preventive maintenance system that lets them drill into. It's very similar to what I was showing earlier to be able to drill into individual pieces. So it's having this big vision, having a leadership that knows they want to get there from a digital twin perspective to be able to manage assets and, and, and spaces, and then to actually have the underlying technology built on an open structure that allows multiple applications to talk to the same source data. That's an, a, 
ongoing challenge with a lot of owners that they have their systems kind of closed in proprietary format that they can't even get to themselves very efficiently. And to be able to do exercises like this at a single location, let alone at the global scale that we're talking about, we need to have some kind of web APIs and ability to share information, share location, share condition of the assets, and share how we ship them back and forth like we showed. Excellent. And uh, when I said it was a conclusion of the workshop, uh, I guess I was wrong because uh, Kimon has an exercise that he wants to go through all also. And then we can spend a minute or two um, talking about how we're going to present what we've just gone through and basically say much of what has already been said, but we want to condense it for the one hour presentation part. Um, but uh, Kimon, will you show us the work order um, process? Sure. So we are we have a work order system running now with Kharkiv with, with the assets that we just placed there, the actual uh, gen sets and arrays and every, everything is in a system now. So if you go to the link that I posted earlier, you actually have a list of everything here. So you could see uh, the Kira pod, for example, is, um, let me type it in here. There it is, the Kira six pods that was sent from, from uh, San Antonio is here in Kharkiv now, it's right sitting off to the side these uh from the work order system itself you can actually say there's we, this the units the lights in this unit are out so you would say lights are out and um that basically has been what we use with the community colleges out lights out and you can classify the type of uh, whatever building maintenance and then you put your name in here and that goes into your request that gets sent to the admin so we're tracking in real time what's happening in the building. And then that's showing up on an admin view that says, okay, here are the list of things that are happening. And what's interesting about this exercise to me is that typically work order systems like this are used on static assets like Mike mentioned, but the fact that these are moving around and being shipped and might get decommissioned and move somewhere else, they're basically, it's basically like a fleet management in many ways, right? Um, but it's the same process, being able to track down to the specific IDs uh, find out what's going on inside that space, uh, see the details of that request, uh, and then um, being able to find additional information. Uh, so you could say, okay, find in the space, look, there's a list of assets in that single room of something happening. So we say, go look at this uh, specific computer here and go fix it. So I would then assign it to, to I'm gonna assign it to Mike. So Mike's getting a request now to go check out that computer in that room, inside that building, in Kharkiv, of that Cura unit that we showed being shipped around. And that's really the power of having these IDs line up and having an open standard way to communicate the digital twin. So all of this all together is a digital twin, whether it's that individual asset, the work request, preventive maintenance for the asset, the tracking, the planning, and then the, uh, the, uh, the, the following through on the life cycle of what, what happens to it. So you can try this yourself. We we have a, I think it's still in the link there, right, Mike? Well, let's uh, let's highlight that. Um, yeah, I could post it again here, but you can feel free to just post something there. You can actually try it out and see what it feels like, because you'll get an email in response, and then you can track what's what the status of it is. And the other important thing about a lot of these systems, a lot of these systems used to be very difficult and complex and expensive to deploy not just ours, but others as well too. But ours, our approach has been, how can we simplify it down and give the end user just a very simple interface on their, their phones to be able to submit a request like that? That was our goal, with zero training. So they're interacting with digital twin data without knowing what the digital twin is. And they're able to then push that data up into a server that then others can react to. And we we're for the, and this is our presentation with LA City College in a few weeks. They were able to deploy that in a month. He said it used to take a lot longer to deploy systems like this, but now quickly they're able to actually have it up and running. And that's the, the key thing with a lot of these solutions. Now you have to be agile, move quickly, not in an emergency situation like this, but on everyday kind of use too. Uh, 